Okay, maybe I can share my screen. I think Jacqueline, can you unshare yours? You can try and stop sharing, yes. Gina, can you stop my share? Yes, one moment. Okay, I think we're gonna get started. The, we'll let the other people trickle in. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the QBI SBI Symposium on Molecular Networks of Cancer and Other Diseases that's been organized by QBI and um, SBI. Uh, we have a great um, list of speakers from both the Bay Area and from um, uh, Dublin uh, listed here. It's over two days. Uh, and we're going to have some opening remarks from uh, Aoife Ryan, who is affiliated with UCD, but actually works here in the Bay Area. Um, did you, I think you're there, Aoife? Thanks, Nevin. And uh, I suppose thank you to Jacqueline, um, in particular, for extending an invitation to provide opening remarks at this QBI, SBI symposium. So I work with um, Science Foundation Ireland, Ireland's primary competitive funder of STEM research, uh, which funds research in Ireland's higher education institutes, akin to the NSF and NIH in, US, in the US. Um, and these funding initiatives are often in partnership with industry or other national and international research funders. And through this funding, we're ensuring that Ireland has the skills, ideas, and technologies that we need to be a true global knowledge economy and that we are addressing societal challenges. I think collaboration is key to successful R&D and I suppose the Ar Ireland and the US have a very shared culture of investment in R&D, recognizing its value and creating a space and appetite for it across companies and universities. And that's why we uh, so value so highly our scientific linkages, which are grounded in personal connections and shared scientific values. And I'm sure we're going to hear a lot of about this over the course of the next two days during the symposium. Uh, these linkages have been reinforced and enhanced throughout the years with collaborative frameworks uh, developed by the NSF, uh, SFI, NIH and many others, in addition to the strengthening partnerships we are seeing between institutions such as the UCD-UCSF affiliation agreement, which is why we're here today. And I suppose SFI, you know, we like to see ourselves as being at the forefront of collaborating with other funders and the extent of that collaboration is, is really extraordinary between the US um, we have over 750 research collaborations between Ireland and US academic institutions and companies. We have specific funding mechanisms such as the US Ireland R&D program to support transatlantic research projects with over 50 research partnerships funded to date. Um, we also have other initiatives to support and encourage international collaboration. For example, our strategic partnerships program through which we've supported Precision Oncology Ireland, support, which is coordinated by SBI and I'm, which I'm sure you'll hear a lot about over the next two days. The POI is a consortium of five Irish universities, cancer research uh, charities and a number of international companies aiming to develop new diagnostics and therapeutics for personalised cancer treatment. I was fortunate to have lived a very short distance from the US UCSF Mission Bay campus over the last couple of years, seeing the impressive hub of biotechnology innovation in full flow. Uh, where academia and industry, industry come together for cutting edge life saving research and through international development activities in the US, SFI's focus is on furthering partnerships between Ireland and the US. So we're really delighted to see this strengthening relationship between UCD and UCSF to reinforce linkages between researchers in Ireland and San Francisco and broaden collaborative abilities. And we'd be happy to discuss ways in which we can further strengthen these capabilities between the two institutions through cross-border partner, partnerships. I trust that this symposium provides an opportunity to discuss the convergence of your aligned research areas, strategic collaborations and opportunities for research exchange. And I thank you for inviting me to provide some remarks and I look forward to the symposium ahead. Thanks, Nevin. All right, thanks, Aoife, for those uh, remarks. We look forward to interacting with you over the next 
several years uh, to facilitate this um, a collaboration between these two institutions. And I just wanted to give one slide here of where I thought kind of this symp symposium came about. Um, it actually was based on a relationship that I had with uh, Jerry Cagney, who's a professor at UCD. I think many people at UCSF maybe remember Jerry. He did a sabbatical here when I first came to UCSF for a year to help set up uh, mass spectrometry. And I was a student at the University of Toronto. I'm actually looking quite serious here, I guess. And he was a postdoc. And we worked very closely together on a, lar on a number of large-scale proteomic studies. And um, we've been really good friends over the last 20 years. And here's a couple of visits that we had, or that I had, with uh, Jerry uh, in Dublin. You can see Coleman and Ariane here. They're going to be speakers uh, over the next couple of days. And then, I guess, after a few visits, we got serious and we started to talk more about um, uh, science and we signed an MOU here um, with uh, Orla Feely, who's the Vice um, President of Research Innovation and um, Impact. And we were supposed to have a symposium um, in person in Dublin in September. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, we we're going to have actually have a tour of the, the Guinness factory, but um, we'll have to do that next time. Uh, and um, we're having this virtually, but hopefully, the next time we have this, uh, as uh, a collaborative group will be in person in Dublin. And um, with Orla, we talked about joint funding. So there's going to be an RFA that comes out of this symposium. Um, we'll talk to Aoife about that as well, uh, where joint groups can be applying for funding. So the, the hope is that there'll be new connections made over the next couple of days, and then there'll be um, an RFA put out um, to for people to put in applications for projects to help seed collaborations that would hopefully lead to larger money in the future. So that was the goal, and that is still the goal that we're uh, doing this um, uh, virtually. And I'm gonna pass it over to Walter. He's gonna give a description of a package that was sent out to all the speakers. And when we organized this, we wanted this around Halloween. Um, this was one of the prerequisites, and Walter will tell you why. Hi, Hi everybody. Great pleasure to be here and welcome you. Um, as Ned, Nevin said, this symposium is really about building bridges, small ones and big ones. And it also coincides with being about Halloween. And what we want to mainly talk about is networks. Uh, we all know networks connect people, connect information, connect data. but they also do something that is timely, very timely at this time of the year. They do connect worlds. And what you see here is a 3D reconstruction of a cave in County Common in Ireland, which is called the Cave of Kids, or Unegat. I probably completely mispronouncing it. And in this cave, connects actually the real world with the fairy world. And that was the Celtic paradise, the land of eternal youth. And you enter this world via this little hole here and then through the, these gates and you dive down in the depths. And that's not only paradise, but paradise also the very dark side, as you can see here. And this is why these gates are also called the gates of hell. And they are open only once a year, and that's at Halloween. And at Halloween, these gates actually were the communication link between the real world in the very world, in the world of spirits. So it is very timely. This is the old connections. We hope to forge new connections. And in order to praise speakers for the journey, we have equipped them with a little gift basket, which contains some traditional items. One is palm bread, which is an Irish type of bread with dried fruit. Uh, <clears throat> and people would have little items in there, which would forecast your for the next year. Unfortunately, most of the forecasts were bad, like uh, will not get married, have an unhappy marriage, have bad luck, but some are good. Getting rich, enjoying good fortune, and of course we hope for the later. There's also a little piece of a fairy wood tree. This is actually these trees underneath where these holes are, above where these holes are, where you can slip into the fairy world at Halloween. And in order to make the journey really um, endurable, uh, we also have added a pint of Guinness. So happy Halloween, everybody, and I hope you all enjoy the meeting.
All right, thanks, Walter. And, and I, um, we've, we've also introduced in uh, something else to try to make this more fun in the spirit of Halloween. Um, we uh, had sent masks out to all the speakers and we had them take pictures of with and without the mask. And what we're gonna do before each talk is show a picture of one of the speakers with the mask. And then there's going to be a um, poll that comes up. This will be for the panelists and for the people listening. And you get to have to choose um, who the person is behind the mask. So I'm looking at this and I think this is the Incredible Hulk. Gina, are you gonna click that? It's up. Well, when, the, when this comes up, everybody picks who they think it is, and then we'll, we'll reveal who the person is after, okay? Uh, so before each uh, talk, we'll have one of these um, uh, guess who's. Uh, and the last thing I just wanna say before we get started is I just wanted to thank um, the organizers um, on both sides here. Um, especially on our side, uh, I'd like to thank Jacqueline Fabias, Gina Wynn, Alexa Court, and Carolina Lindsay for the, the work uh, that they did in organizing this. And I don't know, Walter, if there's somebody you wanted to thank on your end. Yeah, there's a lot of people to thank, especially Marianne, Aiden McKiernan, uh, and the whole SPI team who, who did the work, and was heavily involved in the preparations and preparing the gift baskets. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. So then I'll hand this over to the chair of the first session. I think it's Balin from um, QBI UCSF. Great, thanks so much. It's my pleasure to introduce our first um, presentation of the day. Uh, we have Donald Brennan from UCD and SBI. And please, if you have questions, add them to the Q and A uh, panel and then I can field them to our speakers at the end of the talk. Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you very much and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to present at this meeting. It's, it's a great pleasure to actually kick it off. Um, so hopefully um, everybody can see my slides. Um, so I'm a clinician scientist working between um, a SBI and a number of the hospitals in, around Dublin um, with a focus on uh, gynecological malignancies. And our group works mainly on epithelial ovarian cancer and also on um, weight loss uh, as a treatment for cancer, particularly for endometrial cancer and obesity related carcinogenesis. But today we're just going to talk a little bit about some of the work that's been going on in epithelial ovarian cancer and maybe. This is more of an overarching theme rather than a lot of data with regards to what's the opportunity of ovarian cancer and what are the challenges that we now see. Um, so basically, um, ovarian cancer, has we've not seen really significant improvements in overall survival in ovarian cancer over the last um, three or four decades. And um, the five-year survival, even in the best hands, of stage 3C ovarian cancer, stage 4 cancer is only about 45%. Um, and it's an interesting disease in that it initially responds to chemotherapy, but probably due to its clonal nature, uh, develops chemo resistance fairly quickly. Um, the, from a, at a molecular point of view, it's a disease of a, a, a somatic copy number variation rather than specific driver mutations, which as we all know, make it slightly more difficult potentially to target. But we have got some key success stories, uh, particularly around the area of DNA damage response, which I'm going to um, touch on briefly. Um, but ultimately, whilst we often talk about microscopic issues, ovarian cancer is a macroscopic problem as well. And the pictures on the bottom of the screen really do show what um, we meet on a daily basis. Uh, and this can sometimes help, uh, particularly at a scientific level, people understand the scale of the problem. And these two pictures at the bottom show a, a typical a presentation of a lady who's got advanced ovarian cancer and really the entire every organ in her pelvis is obliterated and here you can see um, the uterus with the large tumor at the back and the sigmoid colon going down into it and oftentimes these all have to be removed um, at the time of surgery to actually um, uh, provide any sort of disease control and one of the big problems i think from um, at a scientific perspective is that we've really never taken any consideration of the impact that surgery might have on the tumor biology or on the systemic immune response 
So even though I said that we've had um, very minimal improvements in survival, uh, we, are, uh, we have a much better understanding of this disease over the last 10 years as a result of large scale sequencing efforts. And we do know now that up to a third of cases um, have HR deficient tumors or homologous recombination deficient tumors, mainly driven by alterations, either germline or somatic alterations in BRCA1 and 2, but also epigenetic alterations in BRCA1 in particular, and also then what we would call non-BRCA related alterations in the um, DNA damage response pathway. And what this is really translated into is a um, very clear uh, new therapeutic option for these patients. But unfortunately, in anybody possibly to the um, right of uh, five o'clock here, or sorry, to the left of five o'clock here in this graph, we have very few uh, therapeutic options. Um, and these patients really do very poorly. And of course, you're probably all aware of the success of PARP inhibitors in uh, the treatment of ovarian cancer. And interestingly, there have been far more successful in ovarian cancer than in, some, in um, other BRCA-related cancers, particularly triple negative breast cancer. Uh, there are now multiple studies out there showing PARP inhibition is an um, important um, new addition to the library with regards to treatment of these cases. But I like study 19 in particular, which is an older study, phase two randomized study of platinum-resistant disease. And really, the, these are the overall survival curves, and they may not look particularly um, great. As you can see on the top curve A, there was an overall survival benefit in the group who got um, a maintenance elaborate compared to the placebo, and maintenance elaborate was in the purple line there. And this was particularly obvious in patients who had a BRCA mutation, as you can see on line B here. However, what's interesting is, um, this has been replicated now in the first, first line in about three big phase three studies which means that we're now bringing PARP inhibitors all the way from the lab into first-line treatment. But I guess what's most interesting from a scientific point of view is from study 19, is 11% of those patients who were randomized to Laparib were on the drug for six year, more than six years now. And these are patients whom we would have expected to have a median survival of about 12 to 14 months. And in fact, we probably think that there's a proportion of these people who are cured of recurrent metastatic ovarian cancer, which is something we never would have believed before. So I think this highlights the opportunity of uh, studying this disease, that there are targets out there, and now really the, the challenges are going to be how we incorporate those new, those new uh, uh, therapeutics into the clinical regime and maybe how we, se how we sequence them. Um, and what I mean by that, of course, is how we give them um, sequential regimens. I suppose the challenges of the disease are very clear, and that is that... Um, the, it is a disease that presents with widespread metastatic disease of presentation, unlike a lot of the cancers that we often think of, such as prostate cancer or breast cancer, uh, where you might, uh, the vast majority of patients present with early stage disease, that's not the case. And one of the big challenges, I believe, for ovarian cancer is that um, most of the profiling that we've had to date has been on primary tumors, whether that be through the TCGA or other large collaborative networks. But really, this is a systemic disease, and we haven't really started to grapple with that, particularly when we talk about uh, large-scale profiling efforts, whether that be proteomics or genomics. And on top of that, as I'll show you in a few minutes, there's very minimal match data from patients on multiple sites uh, uh, where we now know that heterogeneity is a major problem. And as I said earlier, one of the big issues is the, um, how we incorporate surgery into the equation. And our group have been particularly, um, I suppose, uh, to the forefront of this with regards to how we time surgery in um, ovarian cancer, uh, in the ovarian cancer treatment pathway. It's important to realize, as the kaplan Meyer shows there from our own data, that um, really surgery is very important because you can see on the red line on the kaplan Meyer curve there, these are patients in whom we managed to perform a complete macroscopic resection at the time of surgery. And you can see they have a significantly better outcome than any of the other groups of patients. If we leave any tumor behind at the time of operation, there is, they have a very poor outcome. And really, it's actually the, the black, blue, and green lines that we are a real challenge to us, and maybe the group that we really need to be focusing on with regards to future therapeutic targets. And I have to say that even in the PARP studies, these graphs um, show the same uh, trend, whereby uh, surgical uh, resection is, in fact, still the key prognostic indicator, and you will not fix bad surgery by giving a new drug. So one of our areas that we're interested in in our own group with myself and Walter is why does uh, epithelial ovarian cancer not respond to immunotherapy? Because it should. Um, and 
it really hasn't. We've had three, two large phase three trials now that have failed in the, in the frontline setting. And really, in the recurrent setting, there isn't a whole lot of signal to, to suggest that we're going to get response to standard immuno, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. And given the fact that you know, the tumor itself is profoundly antigenic, that there are CDA positive T cells, which are a good prognostic, prognostic indicator, these all suggest that that's true. And work done by a very talented uh, fellow in our, in our lab, Kate Brennan, has shown uh, quite clearly that the, unfortunately the immune um, microenvironment in metast metastatic disease is completely different to that of, um, uh, with regard of, to that of uh, the primary tumour. As you can see here in this graph, CD8 positive T cells are significantly reduced in, in uh, or significantly increased in primary tumour compared to metastasis from the same um, patient. And likewise, we see a decrease in PD-1 and also a decrease in interferon gamma, suggesting that in fact the tumors are cold. And this is important because um, what we're seeming to see is that in the metastasis, as you can see here, we're seeing an immune excluded um, phenotype. And this means, I think, that we really need to start focusing on novel immunotherapies in this area. Um, I'm going to skip on in the interest of time just to say that there is a change in paradigm in this area and really we need to start focusing on moving towards the periphery and that's something that we've been trying to do as opposed to um, trying to actually uh, to uh, sequence and to uh, profile a lot of tumours uh, or metastases. We really need to start moving uh, towards looking at peripheral markers. And you can see here that there are multiple um, high-impact high articles now suggesting that we need to do that. I'm just going to give you a final example of why we need to do this. This is a lady with a low-grade serous cancer of the ovary. Um, we were able to remove a lot of her different uh, tumor sites and sequence a significant number of different um, um, uh, samples from the same patient, both at the time of primary disease, but also at the time of recurrence, and also look at CFDNA. And really what we were able to find was this is what we do in the standard pathological workup. This lady had a low-grade tumor that was P53 wild type with no BRAF, P600E mutation and was a um, microsatellite stable tumor. But through a uh, whole exome sequencing, we were able to identify at the bottom here a novel BRAF um, mutation in D594G, which is a kinase dead mutation. And we were also able to identify an area in chromosome 1 consistent with NRAS um, activation all suggesting that this lady might, ref might respond well to a MEK inhibitor. Um, a really talented PhD student in our lab has been able to develop a novel um, digital uh, PCR assay to track um, the, uh, the mutation both in the different samples, as you can see here, but also in CFDNA. And interestingly, in the left ovary, which we thought was wild type, we were able to identify using the digital um, PCR assay the same um, uh, mutation. I think this is really where we're going to have to push towards, and it's not just going to be CFDNA, unfortunately, it's going to be lots of other ways of actually uh, measuring particularly the immune response in the, um, within the, uh, the periphery if we're going to actually understand how people respond. So to conclude, um, we have demonstrated evidence that there is benefit of translational research and large-scale profiling efforts in ovarian cancer, PARP inhibitors being the greatest example. I think from now on, we must focus on uh, matching metastatic and recurrent samples uh, from, from similar, from a smaller number of patients and move towards the periphery. And we do still think that immunotherapy will play a, a significant role. However, I think that focus needs to be on, on drug combinations and sequential regimens. And ideally, that is uh, an area that we can really start to look at with regards to the impl implementation of mathematical modeling in this area. Uh, and I hope that I've kind of given you an overview of that. Uh, just to thank those who have um, been involved in the study and Romina Silva, Kate Glennon, who have done most of the work for this, and obviously Bruce Moore and our bioinformatician and Sudip Dadas who did the sequencing, and all the people who have done their research. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Um, if any of the attendees or panelists have questions, I think attendees put into the Q&A question section, um, and uh, panelists into the chat. Um, I guess I will start while questions come in. Um, when a lot of the analysis have been done on the whole tumor to look for potential therapeutic targets that are different, do you think that because there is such an immune component that potentially separating out the immune cells from the actual cancer cells would, would allow for like additional analyses or is this more from a single cell perspective where that's sort of determined later on? 
Um, well, I think that most of the data at the moment suggests that the transcriptomic heterogeneity is related to the tumor microenvironment. So I think if you single cell will that be very important in that area. Um, but I think uh, once again, given the heterogeneity of it and the uh, large um, the large tumor mass, that it's actually a lot of it's going to come down to the systemic immune response. I, there's some data suggesting that you know, the significant systemic immune um, suppression in these patients, which might be a novel therapeutic area to actually start to uh, identify. Thank you. Um, I've had a few other questions come in that you can also probably see from our panelists. Um, Kayvon has asked, how did the patient respond to MACI? Um, to how did the patients respond to MEK inhibitor? She did, uh, she responded, she had a very moderate response, unfortunately, but it was very late in the day at that point. Uh, unfortunately, she had, um, uh, she had progressed significantly by the time we were able to offer her that drug. Um, and in fact, it would further, it would get into too much detail. Uh, it was probably unlikely given the type of mutation that she had, that she would actually respond well to it. Thanks. Um, is the BRAF mutation detected in the ascitic fluid um, and then in the mutant BRAF inhibitor treated? Is there a difference in detection sensitivity between serum and the ascitic fluid? So I think that's a really good question. And I think the problem with ascitic fluid, and we've actually done a lot of work on this um, with regards to the publicly available data, and I really have significant worries about using any sort of um, data that's been developed from acidic fluids because it doesn't often um, reflect what's happening in the tumor. And um, in fact, when we do simple clustering of uh, transcriptomic data, the biggest uh, driver of any um, uh, principal component analysis is acidic fluid versus tumor. So we've moved away from acidic fluid for that reason because really it doesn't often reflect the. Um, What's happening in the tumor and to put it in that context we now really won't diagnose ovarian cancer based on acidic fluid we will ask for a biopsy instead great thank you so much um, in the interest of time i think we'll move on to our activity before our next speaker the questions can be answered um, by the speaker in the q a portion um, so donal if you have additional questions to answer you can answer those um, the rest of the talk. We'll transition to our activity. Um, so just a reminder, all of the speakers have taken photos of themselves wearing a mask, and it's our job um, to guess who they are based off of what they're wearing um, and their background, perhaps. So we'll take a few minutes to do this before um, we announce our next speaker. Maybe Bill and we'll just give people like 15 seconds or something to. to yeah, answer. five more seconds now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you haven't, if you haven't guessed already, time is up and you can try next time. Um, do we have an announcement of who this? Great job, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, it is my pleasure to announce our next speaker um, who we all know well um nevin your turn for the floor right. thanks Balin. um so i'm going to give a kind of a summary of our efforts in the context of the cancer cell map uh, uh initiative um i have this skeleton here in the spirit of um halloween not because it's associated with the cancer cell map initiative uh, and this is an initiative that was started uh, by myself and Troy Eidecker several years ago. It involves uh, several scientists, primarily based out of San Francisco and San Diego, and it involves several speakers over the next couple of days, including Kayvon and, and Danielle and um, Alan, who we just saw a great picture of. Uh, and really, the vision here is to um, interpret genomic information via network. So we, we obviously have a lot of genomic data, sequencing data in the cancer world. And I think it's, we're starting to realize there's a limit of what we can extract from that in terms of mechanistic insight behind these different cancers. So the vision here of the CCMI, or the Cancer Cell Map Initiative, is to use network approaches to help make sense of this genomic data. So protein-protein and genetic interaction data, for example, integrating it together. And goals here is to get new biology, 
and to get to new therapies and then to be more predictive with respect to diagnosis and prognosis and um, predicting uh, who should get what treatment if there is a, a treatment. And but the, the challenge here um, that the CCMI is trying to solve is this challenge of heterogeneity. Most variants and mutations are rare and they're very different between patients. And here's a classical example of this. We're looking at TCGA um, data, ovarian cancer cohort of 351 different patient tumors. And I'm just showing you the somatic mutations on chromosome 17 on the x-axis and then on the y-axis is the patients. And you can see there's pretty much only one mutation that's seen across all the patients, and that's P53. And the, the question is, is this even the same disease? Is there some connection across all of these different mutations, which seem to be very disparate and not connected? So um, another way to say this is to say that most diseases are not monogenic. Uh, that was the initial thought, I think, when we started to sequence uh, individuals in tumors. And the problem is um, key mutations often fall below statistical significance in isolation. So what do you do with Manhattan plots such as this? Well, the vision here is to use network-based approaches to help make sense of this genomic data. So if each one of these peaks corresponded to a gene or a protein, uh, and uh, these, say, corresponding proteins or genes were associated in a network, you'd agree with me that this network would make this genomic data much more interpretable. If you just looked at this Manhattan plot, you'd say there's a couple of genes. Who knows if they're connected? But here you'd say, ah, they're all in the same node or the same complex or the same pathway. And in the CCMI, we're heavily uh, leveraging protein-protein interaction uh, analysis and genetic interaction data. And the, the vision here is to have not Manhattan plots of individual genes or genomic loci, but of networks. You'd say all three of these genes are in the same network. This network becomes statistically significant. This is what we should be focusing on. And this could potentially have um, therapeutic value. And another way of, of going kind of deeper here with respect to protein-protein interactions, uh, so say if you have one protein here, say P53, and it's very highly mutated across a number of patients that have the same cancer, that's why this is big X, this is how it would behave here in a Manhattan plot. But say if you had um, three other genes and proteins that were just below the threshold, say B, C, and D, if you knew that B, C, and D, the corresponding proteins were in a protein complex, this would make this genomic data much more interpretable. And actually, this complex would be much more statistically significant than this individual protein A. The peak would be much higher here. And you can look at this in context of mutations, but you can also look at it in the context of viral proteins, because viruses can come in and hijack and rewire the, uh, the host and cause cancer, including HPV um, with uh, cancer. So um, we've uh, recently submitted three uh, public uh, papers on uh, CCMI projects. Uh, one where we've done a large-scale protein-protein interaction map on head and neck cancer. This is led by Danielle Sweeney. She's going to be talking uh, tomorrow. It's a collaboration with Silvio and Jennifer and, of course, Trey. And then we've done a similar thing uh, in breast cancer led by Minkyu Kim, collaboration with Alan and Laura and Trey as well. And then Trey's uh, led the charge on putting all this information together to come up with a hierarchical model of the cancer cell, which is generating a lot of hypotheses that we and others will be testing in the future. And just to briefly go through this, what we've been doing is looking at TCGA in kind of an unbiased way and saying, what are the top mutated genes from TCGA? And we're going to just simply tag and purify them and look at their protein-protein interaction landscape. So we did this for head and neck cancer, and we also did this for um, uh, breast cancer. And I'm just going to show a couple slides from Danielle's work here of a generation of protein-protein interaction maps in head and neck cancer. So we're looking at TCGA, we're taking the top 40, 50, 60 genes, putting affinity tags on them, plus and minus mutations were relevant, purifying them, and then analyzing the networks by mass spectrometry. And we're doing this in cancerous cells and non-cancerous cells as well. And the hypothesis here that proteins involved in interactions seen only in cancerous cells will represent valuable new targets. So these are networks that had been uh, generated from cancerous cells and then non-cancerous cells um, through this particular project. We look at the overlap, there's actually not a great, a, a great degree of overlap, which by itself I think is very interesting, which could be discussed at another time. But for this particular presentation, we're most interested in these interactions that are in the cancerous cells that are not in the non-cancerous cells, because these could represent new proteins that could have therapeutic value. Here's this um, skeleton of this mer-man, or mer-woman, I guess, mermaid. Uh, so here's... Um, a, a one particular connection that we've been working on, that uh, one of the 15 that are only seen in the head and neck cancer cell lines, this is what this um, orange line, um, or sorry, this pink line represents, it's a connection between FGFR3, a very well characterized cancer gene, with this one that isn't so characterized, um, a DAPL. We only see that in the head and neck cancer cells, 
And we've shown that knockdown of DAPL inhibits FGFR signaling, and DAPL is actually a GEF that interacts with tyrosine kinase receptors, which makes a lot of sense. So we've been working on this particular connection. We think this is a, an exciting new therapeutic avenue. I told you, of course, that viruses also cause cancer, and HPV is connected highly to head and neck cancer. So instead of mutated proteins, you can also look at the HPV proteins. This was a study led by Manon Man Eckhart. So we tagged and purified all the HPV proteins. Um, and um, those are the diamonds here. And then the circles correspond to co-purifying human proteins. The bigger the circle, the more mutated it is in HPV minus cancer. So you got P53 here with E6, which is what expected. You also get P16 actually with E5, which has uh, not been previously uh, reported, which um, we're working on. But the one connection I want to highlight here is a connection between RNF20 and RNF40 connected to L2. Um, so RNF20 and 40, it's the ubiquinal ligase that ubiquitinates histone H2B um, of the nucleosome and on K123, and this is involved in transcriptional um, elongation and transcriptional regulation. When you look at the individual mutated genes of RNF20 and 40, they're below what's considered statistically significant, but if you know they're in a complex, it goes above the statistical significant threshold. Um, and um, mutations in RF20 and 40 complex are enriched in HPV minus head and neck cancers. And we've actually shown that um, HPV viral protein L2 interacts with both of these to promote tumor invasion. Down here, I'm just showing you when you express L2, which has not been previously connected to oncology, you actually get this invasion phenotype associated with cancer. And then when you CRISPR out RNF20 and RNF40, which I'm not showing, you can uh, suppress this particular phenotype. So this is a connection that we also think has uh, a great value that people are just not looking at in the context of head and neck cancer. So we can look across different cell types, but we're also uh, looking across different mutations. And this is one example, this PIK3CA, it's highly mutated across many cancer types, including head and neck cancer. Uh, and what we're doing is looking at what effects the mutations have on the interaction landscape. Danielle's gonna go into more detail into this particular uh, uh, vignette. We've been doing this for many genes now, BRCA1, so I mean, Q's been working on BRCA2, P53. I think this is a very powerful way to get new biology. We're also using these maps to be predictive with respect to patient stratification and which group should get which uh, drugs if there are uh, drugs or treatments available. And I'm just looking at this. I think this is a Chihuahua skeleton. This isn't actually scary at all, but um, here it is. Um, and uh, so what I'm gonna say is Danielle is gonna go into more details of this uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, looking at the protein-protein interaction network of um, uh, head and neck cancer. And I just want to show uh, one other slide here um, that's connected uh, to uh, collaboration with Trey Eidecker. This is where we're trying to put all of this information together to come up with systematic protein network maps um, of cancer genes, coming up with a hierarchical model of the uh, cancer cell. And we're using a bunch of information, including the data that we're generating, but we're combining it with other type of data the, the biggest driver of these maps is actually protein-protein interaction uh, uh, data. And um, here is just a, a map of mutated systems. We're calling these groups of proteins or gene systems across 13 different uh, cancer types, including head and neck cancer and um, a breast cancer. Uh, so uh, we're very, very excited about these maps that are, that are being generated. And if you're interested in this particular map, I'd encourage you to go to this, this website. Uh, and these maps are making predictions that then we're testing in the lab. And then in a reiterative way, that's informing how we collect uh, data uh, in, in the future so that these maps will be refined and get better and better and have more and more uh, predictive value. And this last point I wanna make is that we don't just have the Cancer Cell Map Initiative, we have other mapping initiatives, including the Psychiatric Cell Map Initiative that's being co-led by uh, Jeremy Wilsey and Matt State, and then the Host Pathogen Map Initiative with Jeff Cox at UC Berkeley, the underlying technology is the same as you go across uh, all these different diseases, which to me is great, but what's even better is that the biology is very similar as well. So it's the same genes mu being mutated in breast cancer that are being hijacked by SARS-CoV-2, and it's the same genes being mutated in autism that are being hijacked, say, for example, by, by um, uh, Zika. So these maps are bringing not just genes and proteins together, but they're bringing scientists together that are working on different disease areas. And I believe this is where these big breakthroughs are going to come in uh, in the future. So I'll end there and I'd be um, happy to take any questions on this work. Great. Thanks, Evan. Um, a few questions have come in. One, did you perform differential quantification of proteins by mass spec? And if so, what approach did you use to quantify? top three most abundant peptides in a bottom-up analysis or using tags maybe? So we're, we're, if you don't, it's a good question. If you don't see a, um, 
a, a, a protein interaction in one cell type and you see it in another, it could be, well, maybe that protein's not just being expressed, right? So uh, Danielle and her crew have been going and doing deep proteomic analyses uh, to look at abundance, um, uh, to try to rule that out. And you can't get every protein, but for the most part, when you see a differential interaction, we're ruling out it's not just due to abundance in a particular cell type. And the analysis that she's using uh, is label-free, which um, it turns out to be, um, uh, I think, quite effective in this type of analysis. And this, this differential interaction mapping, it's a, it's a really cool algorithm that we've, done, we've created with um, uh, Trey Eidecker to come up with these maps, which I didn't have time to go into. Great, thank you. Another question we have is, have you looked to see if there are differences in protein-protein interactions in 2D versus 3D culture? Yeah, not, we're starting to, to, to look in organoid models um, with some of our viral work with Melanie Ott here at the Gladstone in, in hepatitis B and C and, and um, liver, and also now with, I guess, with SARS-CoV-2 with lung. Um, but we haven't done that systematically. That is something that we would like to do. I'd actually, I'd rather use the organoid models for genetic validation than for generating new protein-protein interaction data. But I, I think we're gonna be doing both. Great, thanks. Another question. Um, there are some, there are apparently some PI3K inhibitors that are mutant specific. Any data on differential disruption of these protein protein complexes that explain how these um, inhibitors work? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. This was something actually Kayvon had suggested that we, we did, uh, we should do. He suggested this a couple weeks ago. Um, Danielle is going to show some data with HER3 inhibitors, which work upstream of PIK3CA, but you're absolutely right. There are these PIK3CA inhibitors, and it'd be really cool to see what effects, well, the inhibitors have with the wild type, and then what effects they have in the context of different mutants um, with respect to protein-protein interaction data. So this is something that's definitely on our list to do. Great. Um, and then finally, are protein maps for different types of cancer that are driven by HPV similar? Yeah, so HPV is connected um, to cervical cancer, obviously, and head and neck cancer. Uh, Manon had generated data, I think, in both head and neck cells and cervical cells, and the data was quite similar, but there were some differences um, as well. So overall, I think it was very, very similar, but um, there were uh, different connections, and obviously the, those differences could be quite revealing with respect to how HPV induces cancers in different cell types. Great, thanks so much. Um, and then finally, one more question. Um, does your study include identifying the functional nature of interaction? Absolutely, so a big part of this is now going back and doing genetic analysis. So I talked a lot about protein-protein interaction data, obviously, which is not, it infers function, but it doesn't give you functional information. Initially in the intro, I said, we're combining these two types of things together. Now that we got these list of proteins from our protein-protein interaction, analysis, we're going back and doing single perturbation studies and then double knockdowns, double perturbation studies to get a better idea of the pathways um, that are involved in these cancers and how, they're, how different mutations perturb them. So that is definitely the next step. And that's what we've done in, in model organisms for many, many years. And now that CRISPR is making mammalian cells almost as tractable as yeast, we can start to do this in, in 2D and hopefully 3D models as well. Great. Any additional questions will be answered by Nevin um, in the chat or Q&A section. Um, we'll move on to our activity before our next speaker. So a reminder, you have 10-ish seconds to do this. All right. Hopefully you have all submitted your thoughts as to who this may be. Nice job, Charlie. Um, all right, so our next speaker is uh, Maria Principe from UCD, um, and I'll let her introduce her own talk. Hello, everybody. 
and here. Sorry, just having some technical. So many thanks for the invitation. Okay, many thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, co-regulators of hormone receptors as novel therapeutic approach for prostate and breast cancer. So prostate and breast cancer are the most diagnosed cancer worldwide, as you can see here uh, in this map from all the purple and pink. And they share many similarities, uh, which we can exploit uh, to um, identify uh, targets, uh, therapeutic targets, um, uh, which uh, we can identify in one type of cancer and use for uh, the other type. So I suppose for this talk, I will focus mostly on prostate cancer, uh, but the idea is to identify targets in prostate and then uh, use them also in breast and vice versa. So um, when prostate cancer is diagnosed early, uh, we have curative therapies such as surgery and radiation. However, up to a third of patients relapse in response to these uh, treatments and others present with already metastatic uh, prostate cancer. For these patients, uh, androgen deprivation therapy is offered. Uh, however, uh, most uh, all patients relapse to develop a more aggressive form of the disease, which is known as castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Uh, and this, uh, up until a few years ago, we only had uh, chemotherapy uh, for castrate-resistant prostate cancer in the form of dosidaxel. Uh, but now, uh, in, in the last few years, we uh, have next-generation antiandrogens, such as, for example, uh, enzalutamide. However, the problem of resistance to these therapies uh, uh, is still here, and therefore we need uh, novel and better targets in this space. So in order to do this, we started by looking at a cellular model of castrate resistance. Um, and we uh, did a, a gene chip experiment and identified uh, transcriptomic profiling. Uh, and then uh, we used the bioinformatic approach uh, to identify transcription factors associated with this transcriptomic profiling. And this led us to identify uh, 11 transcription factors associated with Straight resistance in this model. And of these 11, I am focusing on the serum response factor, SRF. SRF is the widely expressed transcription factor which is involved in uh, cell signaling pathways uh, uh, important uh, for cancer, such as the smooth muscle differentiation, which controls cytoskeleton organization and cell migration and invasion. And of course, it's important for uh, metastatic um, uh, spread. And the early gene response signaling pathway, which controls cell cycle, apoptosis, cell differentiation and proliferation. And of course, it's very important for cancer cell uh, survival. So our group and others have identified the link between SRF and the androgen receptor. And this is very important because as I showed earlier uh, in the prostate cancer management slide, uh, the androgen receptor is still a key target of, uh, for, for prostate cancer, both at the early stages, uh, but also uh, at the castrate resistance uh, stage. And it is also gaining traction in the field of triple negative uh, breast cancer for which there are uh, no targeted therapies. Uh, the problem, however, is that uh, there is resistance associated with targeting the androgen receptor. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, we would like to uh, target the androgen receptor in a more um, focused way uh, through certain transcriptional pro uh, programs. Uh, so uh, an alternative way would be uh, to target AR uh, through its cofactors. And SRF seems to be uh, quite a good uh, candidate for that. So the workflow that we are following is, first of all, validation in tissues from patients, then functional and mechanistic studies in vitro, uh, and their validation in vivo. And then hopefully we'll be able to feedback these two patients through clinical trials. 
So I have access to a collection of tissue microarrays uh, which recapitulate uh, disease progression for prostate cancer. And over the past few years, we have stained these uh, TMAs with antibodies specific for SRF using immunohistochemistry. And we have shown that high SRF expression is associated with biochemical recurrence, survival from time of diagnosis with prostate cancer and castrate resistant prostate cancer, and response to docetaxel. Most recently, we have also shown an association with response to enzalutamide. And here is the, the data for that. So uh, we've shown that uh, uh, in tissues from both uh, visceral and bone metastasis, high SRF expression is associated with shorter su uh, survival on enzalutamide. And we take that as a proxy of enzalutamide uh, response. So in vitro, we are inhibiting SRF using three small molecule inhibitors. We have the CCG uh, series of compounds which uh, inhibit SRF transcriptional activity by targeting MRTF, which is a key cofactor of SRF. And we also uh, are using lasaurtinib, uh, which inhibits uh, SRF uh, by uh, inhibiting the PKN1, which convey androgen responsiveness to uh, SRF. And lesaurtinib is actually a very um, interesting inhibitor because it's already used in the clinic, for example, for uh, acute uh, leukemia. And therefore, um, if these experiments are successful, uh, we can think of uh, moving this drug for prostate cancer patients um, more easily. So this is just a summary of some of the entity uh, assays that we have performed, uh, looking at IC50 values at five days following the inhibitors um, uh, treatment. And we did this with the two isogenic uh, prostate cancer uh, cell lines and four um, triple negative breast cancer cell lines. You can see the IC50 values of these drugs. And uh, you may think that maybe uh, in the re uh, region of the micro Molar is uh, these are high IC50, but actually uh, they are very similar to the IC50 of enzalutamide, which is the next generation anti androgen uh, used in the clinic. So that's encouraging. You can also see that uh, CCG257081 uh, has lowest IC50 values compared to the, the 1423 across the board, and that is because uh, the, the 25 has um, better pharmacokinetic characteristics. And then finally, we're still completing the last step, but you can already see that the IC50 values are quite low. And again, this is uh, pretty encouraging. Um, what we're doing next is com uh, combining these SRF inhibitors with enzalutamide and see whether uh, there is um, an advantage in the uh, combination treatments. I'm only going to give you an, uh, one example uh, for the LNCAP uh, ABLE cells. Um, here you can see the combination with CCG1423 uh, and ENSA, and here with LESTA. And in both cases, uh, you can see that the IC50 of uh, enzalutamide decreases with increasing uh, con uh, concentrations of either LESTA or uh, CCG. Here you have the IC50 value for CCG and here for, for LESTA. So again, it would seem that the combination works better than the single treatment. So we next brought uh, this combination between CCG1423 and ENSA in uh, vivo uh, in collaboration with University of Washington, where they have developed uh, a collection of prostate-derived xenografts from uh, patients uh, uh, who died with uh, castrate-resistant prostate cancer. We picked a line with a minimal response to enzalutamide. We treated the mice for six weeks. And you can see a snapshot here of the tumor volume at uh, week four. 4.5, uh, we showed significant decrease of tumor volume, um, both for the single treatment and for the combination. And this was reflected in the uh, decreased PSA concentration. We also looked at survival and we found that the uh, combination group had an, uh, um, a survival advantage uh, compared to the controls. And that was not true for the single treatments. So again, the combination seems to be uh, better than single treatments. 
Uh, finally, uh, because of the uh, link between SRF and AR, we looked at uh, AR expression in the tissues from this PD axis and found that uh, um, a treating with CCG1423 had the same effect as uh, on AR uh, uh, lo uh, subcellular localization as enzalutamide. So um, AR was retained in the cytoplasm. We quantified this immunohistochemistry using a nuclear algorithm, and indeed, uh, treating with CCG uh, has an effect uh, in uh, nuclear AR um, uh, translocation. So we have decreased the AR uh, in the nucleus uh, following CCG. And this is very exciting because if you remember, the aim of this was to find uh, um, alternative ways of targeting uh, the AR signaling pathway uh, through its co so in summary, high SRF expression in patients is associated with worse outcome. SRF inhibition decreases cell viability singly and in combination with enzalutamide in vitro and in vivo. Uh, SRF inhibition results in reduced AR nuclear localization. So based on this, we think that SRF represents a promising, a promising alternative way of targeting AR. I'd like to thank the, the patients and their family, um, uh, uh, Bill Watson and team, uh, Liam Gallagher and the CBT lab team, the students who are working with me on this project, our collaborators and my funding agencies. And thank you all for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Maria. Um, just a reminder to put all of your questions into the Q&A section or the chat if you're a, part, a panelist. Um, I, I have a question in terms of a little bit about the chemistry of the molecules. Have there been additional, like further elaborations to try to develop them to be able to treat slightly lower concentrations or because there are therapeutics that are at that concentration, it's less of a priority? So um, for the the, the less ortinib, um, I think people are not working on the uh, chemistry of that compound. As I said, it's already used in the clinic and it's effective and it doesn't have uh, usually detrimental side effects. So um, they're not working on that. For the CCG series, actually, um, there is this group uh, who are uh, still working on it and there are a lot of um, um, analogs of these molecules and you know they're working on uh, improving the, the, the chemistry of, of uh, these compounds. But you can see from the first molecule, the CCG1423, to the second already, uh, they have, you know, um, improved on the pharmacokinetic, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Well, if there are no additional questions, um, we can move on to our activity. Thank you again, Maria. Um, before our last speaker of this section. Um, give you about 10 seconds again. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, our, our final speaker for this, for this morning um, is Kathy Giacomini from TBI and UCSF. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, let me make sure I'm off mute, yes. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank Nevin and the QBI team for inviting me to speak today. I want a special thanks to UC Dublin and Walter Koch and others for establishing this partnership. I have a special relationship with UC Dublin through my daughter who did a year there while she was a Berkeley student. She particularly loved UC Dublin. She said it was to tell you that UC Dublin was the most welcoming place for international students. So hopefully part of this collaboration partnership will include student exchange. Um, so today I'll be talking about transporters in the solute carrier superfamily. I'll describe some studies we've recently been doing in de-orphaning um, several of the transporters. 
And uh, so this slide shows homology relationships of transporters in the entire SLC superfamily in the human genome. There are about 450, maybe 500 transporters. They cluster together based on sequence homology into 65 families. And I'm using about 25% sequence identity there. Many of the transporters sit on the plasma membrane where they mediate intracellular uptake of their solutes, but there are many others on intracellular organelles like mitochondrial transporters, lysosomal transporters. Many of the transporters in this family are facilitated transporters. They simply move their substrates down an electrochemical gradient, but others may be coupled to an ion gradient and they thus may be secondary active transporters like sodium dependent transporters. Um, transporters that most people are familiar with are in this family, the SLC6 family, that's the neurotransmitter tr uh, transporter family. So those include the dopamine transporter, the serotonin transporter, the norepinephrine transporters, targets for antidepressants. The transporter family that my laboratory has been focused on for a number of years is the SLC22 family, the organic ion transporter family. And I'll tell you why we're particularly interested in that uh, family. And today I'll be talking about deorphining a couple of transporters. I'll focus mostly as an example on SLC22A15 new work in my laboratory. Um, so one of the reasons as pharmacologists we find this transporter family so interesting is that many of the transporters in this family are highly promiscuous. That means they interact with structurally diverse molecules, so they interact with a variety, an array of prescription drugs. So they play important roles in the disposition pharmacokinetics of many clinically used drugs. Um, and they become clinical they've become critical targets for drug-drug interactions. In fact, um, before drug approval, the FDA and indeed the EMA require drug interaction uh, liability studies on new molecules that they approve. And they particularly, you have to look at your new molecules as interacting against CYPs or cytochrome P450s as well as transporters. And of the 10 transporters required for study, three are in the SLC22 family. These are organic anion transporters, which, which transport a whole bunch of drugs that are anionic in nature, and organic cation transporters shown here. Um, there's also some drug targets in this family. Um, you're at one, a target for um, anti-gout medications. Okay, so I'm now showing you um, uh, phylogenetic uh, relationships in the SLC22 family um, in the human genome. Um, and you can see there's about, I think, 28 to 30 transporters. They cluster together very interestingly based on charge specificity. Remember, this is an organic um, ion transporter family. So the cation transporters are shown here in blue. These are organic cation transporters in the liver, kidney, and all over the place. Zwitterion transporters tend to cluster together, and anion transporters are shown in red. But very interestingly, in this family, and indeed in the whole SLC super family, about, you know, there's, in this family, there's around 10, um, 10 orphan transporters. And when I say orphan transporters, I mean absolutely nothing is known about their functional characteristics, either the human transporter or their direct species orthologs. We just don't know what they do. I mean, you can make a guess based on where they cluster, but I can tell you, at least in my laboratory, those guesses may be a little bit wrong. Um, so um, a few years ago, actually, um, let me get this up. Um, we de-orphaned SLC22A24. And you can see it clusters together with um, anion transporters. And indeed, we've discovered it was an organic anion transporter. But very interestingly, it had a high preference for steroid conjugates. So sulfate and glucuronide conjugates um, is what this transporter preferred. And individuals who carry a genetic variant, a, genetic, a common genetic polymorphism of this transporter, have different levels of glucuronide, steroid glucuronide conjugates, and, um, and also of the actual steroids. So it's, it's quite interesting how you can discover new substrates for these transporters or substrates. Um, so I'm now going to focus on SLC22A15. Um, and you can see that it's clustering um, together um, with zwitterion transporters. So that gives us some clue. So let me shift gears and talk about ergothionine. So ergothionine is an antioxidant. It has CNS uh, protective effects. 
you can see it right here. It says Witter ion. It's very polar. It's not going to cross plasma membranes or cell membranes without some kind of a transporter. It's synthesized by fungi. I'm showing you here a bunch of mushrooms. It's also synthesized by some bacteria, tuberculosis, for example. Um, um, it's found in cells throughout the body, but it's not synthesized by, as far as I know, any animals and certainly not by mammals. Um, yet we find it in high levels in brain, okay, millimolar levels. It's been termed a longevity vitamin. Um, it's associated with longer lifespan in certain model organisms, and it may protect against dementia. Um, so many years ago, the reason we became interested in ergothionine is that, um, oh, it's also speculated that it might be useful in COVID-19. Um, so many years ago, we became interested in ergothionine. We hadn't really heard about it, but a transporter in the 22 family um, was in a way de-orphaned and, and, and found to be a very selective ergothionine transporter. It had previously been told, been said to be a carnitine transporter. It had a minuscule uptake of carnitine and people called it a carnitine transporter. But Grundemann in 2005 and his colleagues de-orphaned it and found that it transported ergothionine quite well. Um, and so that, that, that was interesting to us and we became interested in that. And what was very interesting was that although it transported ergothionine, as I said, ergothionine is found at millimolar levels in brain, um, this transporter, Octan-1, isn't hardly found or found at much low, very low expression levels in all regions of the brain. So we postulated at that point, and I think so did Grundemann at all, that there must be other ergothionine transporters in the genome uh, to account for the accumulation um, in the brain. And if you look at SLC um, 22A15, and this is um, you know, from GTEx, you can see it's at much higher transcript levels in CNS regions. So it seemed like a pretty good candidate. Plus, as you saw, it clusters together with um, uh, zwitterionic uh, transporters. So um, to de-orphan transporters, one of the things you can use or one of the nice tools you can use are metabolomic analyses that have been conducted um, and genome-wide genotyping. So this kind of analysis can tell you something about substrates. So we looked at ergothionine and asked what transporters does ergothionine associate with? And it indeed associates with Octan-1, SLC22A4, um, but we also found that it associates with um, SLC22A15. Um, at lower p-values, 10 to the minus 5, not 10 to the minus 30, but still it does associate with that. So that made us think that this transporter um, could indeed be an ergothionine uh, transporter. Um, we conducted metabolomic studies on uh, cells expressing SLC22A15, an empty vector, um, and we, uh, heart after 24 hours, uh, we exposed to fetal bovine serum, we sent the uh, cell lysates to, uh, I think, metabolon, and they returned to us some 400 metabolites, but only a f some of them were statistically um, significant or si statistically higher in the SLC22A15 um, cells, and those included ergothionine compared to um, the um, empty vector cells, um, and uh, carnosine as well. Um, so we tested them as substrates for the transporters. And as you can see, we had a wonderful uptake, a 30-fold uptake compared to empty vectors shown down here of ergothionine and carnosine, and then a little bit less uptake of carnitine and some other compounds. We also looked at michaelis menten studies. We found it had a KM of around 400 micromolar. We found it was dependent on sodium. When you took sodium out, ergothionine uptake was reduced. We also tried it with other prescription drugs or with prescription drugs. We looked for zwitterionic prescription drugs that were CNS active. Gabapentin is taken up by SLC22A15 quite well, as you can see, not like ergothionine, but seven-fold uptake. So we feel it may take up zwitterion substrate. So in summary, we de-orphaned SLC22A15. It's a sodium sensitive zwitter ion transporter. It seems to prefer ergothionine, also likes carnitine, carnosine. It's localized to the plasma membrane. 
I didn't show you those data, but we did localize it there. It's found in the brain uh, in abundance. It transports gabapentin and possibly other ionic drugs. And I'd like to thank uh, Dina Butrago Silva, a graduate student in my laboratory at Sukwayi, as well as others, and some funding support on fumes, at least from NIH and FDA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, we have a question. Is there any coordination between the expression of the SLCs and metabolic networks? So does the production or demand for certain metabolites control expression of SLCs or the other way around? Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's interesting. We spend a lot of time looking at network analysis because we have a goal sort of on fumes in my laboratory to de-orphan a bunch of these transporters. I mean, I feel like if 20% of the human genome, we don't know what it's doing, we feel like we need to, um, we need to be de-orphaning them and figuring it out. So um, I, 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 I feel like the, the question of that is, I mean, the answer to that is that there is some coordination, but I, and we have spent time looking at it um, between some metabolic na uh, networks, and that kind of helps us to do some of this deorphaning because we try to pick the lowest hanging fruit for the deorphaning. So there is some. I, I don't think it'll give us total answers to what these transporters are doing, but there is some hints. Great, thanks so much. Uh, I have a question that might be somewhat naive, but for um, patients who, and if these, if these SLCs are mutated, do you see effects in terms of either neurodegenerative disease or treatment outcomes associated with any sort of therapeutics that you're trying to transport over? Oh, yeah. I mean, so a whole bunch of SLC mutations are responsible for Mendelian disease. I think there's like we've found 120 transporters are mutated to cause Mendelian diseases. Um, so yes, mutations are found to cause disease in genome-wide association studies. Transporters come up as a genome-wide level significant hits for common diseases as well. So we get both Mendelian disease and human uh, diseases for the transporters depending what they're doing. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, all right, that concludes our first portion of the symposium. We'll take a five minute break um, and meet back here, I guess it's 918. Um, see you all then. Thanks so much to all the speakers who've, who've talked thus far. Okay, everybody, um, you have another chance to vote here ahead of you. So you've only got five seconds this time, I believe, to vote very quickly. So well done, you got it right. Um, so I'm Colin Ryan, and I'm going to be the host for the next part of this conference. Um, thank you to Balin so, for doing a great job so far. And first up in this session, we have 
Liam Gallagher from UCD. Hi there, everybody. Uh, thanks very much, Colin. Uh, just to continue the, um, I was going to share my screen. Hopefully you can hear me. Can you hear me okay, Colin? Yeah, I can hear you fine. And we okay, can see great. your screen. So so obviously uh, to continue the Halloween theme, which actually in some some people think it's actually potentially a more important festival or, or kind of period of or of the year than, than Christmas. This is from an old picture. And, you know, unfortunately, we won't be able to do uh, trick or treating this year, but we have the, a lot of traditions in terms of one of those is bobbing for the apple, which is kind of indicated here. And it's kind of interesting kind of picture because you can see. On the left hand side, you've got, you know, a child kind of not sure if he's crying or is it just after getting his apple and drawing the water from his eyes. But you certainly just behind us, there's a, a child screaming for attention to have another go. Um, so I'm going to talk just briefly about a specific story that I suppose taking a, a discovery from our lab and trying to bring it closer to clinical implementation. And our starting point was really, I suppose, reverse engineering gene expression data relating to breast cancer to try to find upstream master regulators and then uh, focusing on those putative master regulators in terms of a diagnostic assay. So I should indicate I have some disclosures and the particular technology I'm going to talk about has been licensed into the spin-out company Oncomark uh, and I'm a co-founder and chief scientific officer. Another disclosure is I do know this guy here, uh, Paddy O'Leary, who, who I believe is in Alan Ashworth's lab at the moment. He did a PhD in my lab. And uh, he kind of has converted into this kind of endurance running uh, kind of uh, aspect. So, uh, uh, hello, Paddy. So just, uh, just this is a particularly well-trodden field, particularly in the breast cancer area. There's a variety of different multi-gene prognostic signatures, which are pretty much offering the same utility, trying to predict outcome of uh, patients with early stage breast cancer and hopefully avoid unnecessary chemotherapy. So particularly in the context of ER positive breast cancer. And again, the prototype signatures in that space was Oncotype DX and Mammoprint. And then there were some second generation assays which came on the scene. But if you look at it, you know, there, we're talking about a variety of different genes within the signatures uh, and different ways of actually finding those signatures with essentially the same downstream utility practically, but pretty much the signatures were minimally or non-overlapping. So we decided to take a different perspective. And a number of people commented on the fact we have these different tests, different genes within the tests, and pretty much they're, they're, they offer different kind of prognostic utility. So our starting point was really, could we go look at these uh, different gene expression signatures and apply a bioinformatic approach that Andrea Califano uh, developed called Arachne, where you can actually re reverse engineer from gene expression data to find putative master upstream regulators. And so we did this across a variety of different diverse gene expression data relating to breast cancer prognosis. And fundamentally, we came up with a, the uh, across diverse different sets of data, the same set of putative MTORs. And our assay really, our, our, our technology is really based on looking at these at about the RNA and protein level. I suppose part of it is really, um, is indicated here from this initial paper that we published in Feb's journal. Really, the output from an arachne analysis here, you have these greens and uh, are the genes which are in the green circles are essentially indicative of the uh, genes within those example signatures. In this case, it's from a proliferation signature. And what we're indicating in, the, in red are the putative master control genes, which are kind of coordinately exp uh, regulating those genes in some way, either directly or indirectly. So fundamentally, instead of measuring you know, 50 or 100 of these downstream genes, well, my, my, you can actually represent the same information content by just looking at a small number of putative master regulators. And the eureka moment for us was when we did this across a variety of different, different gene expression signatures, we found the same set of MTRs popping up at the top in terms of ranking. And again, importantly, what we showed using both chip PCR and chip sequencing was that these either directly bind to or indirectly regulate the expression of these downstream genes, these prognosis related genes. When we look at these, and we're talking about, say, 10 or so genes, when we map the functions of these genes, some are pretty well studied, like FOXM1, and some are less well studied genes, but pretty much they've been mapped across a variety of different hallmarks of cancer. And I suppose what we've been doing over the last number of years is really taking that observation from a lab and trying to create an assay that's essentially approved for, from a regulatory context, in this case, CE marking in the European context, and gone through a period of analytical and clinical validation. And this is going to give you some highlights from that. 
and, and this is a kind of a different body of work, I guess, from discovery. It's taken that discovery onwards. And fundamentally, what we did is over that time period is reduced this signature from 10 or so genes into three genes, FOXM1, PTG1, ZNF, and we combine this with clinical information into either a molecular score or a, a risk score, essentially a simple zero to 10 score with a kind of cutoff between low and high risk, around five. And we essentially have packaged this up as a, a CE marked assay, a kit where you distribute the kit as a decentralized assay. You can apply it on the standard RT-PCR platform. You output the data into a risk calculator and you output a, a risk score. And what I want to just do is just highlight some kind of key, the currency really in terms of clinical validation is really, um, does it work? Is it significantly prognostic? And does it add value on top of standard clinical data? And so I'll just give you highlights from two different uh, studies. One we published earlier this year in clinical cancer research from a well-studied cohort called TransAttack, and the other from a subset of a very big, essentially the world's biggest clinical trial ever performed in cancer, which is the Taylor X study, and where we looked at the Irish patients within that cohort. And so the ATTACK study was a, a large-scale uh, study primarily done in the UK looking at different uh, endocrine therapies. And there was essentially a translational arm to that where uh, Mitch Dowson and Jack Cusack really looked at pulling out just over a thousand samples. And uh, for example, a whole variety of different prognostic signatures have been assessed on that cohort. And we got essentially the last bit of RNA that was within that cohort to actually look at our signature. So there was a paper, a benchmarking paper published in JAMA Oncology, which looked at six of these signatures. Some to, uh, one is actually just clinical data on its own, which is pretty good, called a clinical treatment score developed by Jack Cusack. And Mitch Dowsett and Ivana Sestak. And then IHC4 is just a simple IHC based surrogate. And then you've got four molecular signatures. And essentially, just the summation is you have two different variants. The first generation, like the Oncotype DX assay, which is reasonably okay. And then you've got second generation, which have a, a better performance. So when we assessed our assay on this particular uh, uh, cohort, we have pretty good performance in both node negative and a node positive context which is, uh, uh, has at least the same level of performance of those second generation signatures. And particularly we have good performance, uh, particularly at, in, in the context of late recurrence. Again, traditionally, uh, uh, patients with ER positive breast cancer are normally recommended endocrine therapy for five years. And the next question is, should you give them another five years of endocrine therapy? Should you give them extended endocrine therapy? And the key question is, can you predict this late recurrence event? And the key part for us was really uh, benchmarking our signature versus, I suppose, the market leader in the space, which is Oncotype DX. And we, again, we have improved performance versus on about a, a univariate level. And importantly, we provide additional value on top of, of clinical data. Um, here, so for example, the clinical treatment score, NPI or KI67. Here, we're looking at, I can't even see it with my screen here. Yeah, this is looking at in lymph node uh, negative samples specifically. So this is the kind of example output that would be given to a clinician in terms of a decision point. You'd have a, a kind of a report where you'd have a risk score. You'd categorize the patients as high risk. So in this case, you probably would recommend not to give chemo, or you would recommend to give chemotherapy. And this would be a probability of distant recurrence, which is mapped on that trans attack data. The other key cohort that we looked at was essentially the Taylor X cohort. So I have the red dot of death now at the moment. So I have another two minutes. So this is really looking at uh, a subset of patients which participated in the Taylor X study, which is around 11,000 patients worldwide. And Ireland were some, uh, some of the Irish hospitals there were some of the world's biggest accrual centers to that uh, study. And I'm gonna give you a flavor of, uh, we looked at our signature in that cohort. And I really want to acknowledge all the different clinical sites around Ireland that participated in providing materials for that. And essentially what we did is we separately consented and enrolled patients for this particular study. And the summation is we looked at Oncomaster performance in this, in this subset of just over 400 patients. And again, we showed superiority in terms of prognostic stratification compared to the groups which are defined by Oncotype DX, Taylor X subgroups, or by, uh, by Oncotype DX. And again, we have the same superior performance both on univariable analysis and also multivariable analysis on top of other clinical parameters. And I suppose this simple schematic really indicates that, that you know, we can actually have much better segregation. For example, we can classify in this, uh, uh, we had a small number of events, about 18 patients had a distant recurrence event out of 400. We classify pretty much most of the patients which exhibit a distant recurrence events into a high 
classification based on oncomaster, master and again much better segregation than what is seen with the um, use of something like recurrent score and again these are just the genes i won't have time to talk about the functionality some of these genes actually do have a functional role in terms of uh, tumor progression and are druggable and the last thing i want to mention is while we've looked at this specific signature you know in detail at the rna level we're specifically interested in also looking at it at the protein level so i have an um uh, an SFI investigator grant specifically trying to look at these targets at the protein level and develop a multiplex assay that could be used, for example, using, say, multiplex imaging using fluorescent approaches. And we've done some initial feasibility work in that context, trying to combine it as a signature on a single assay format. So again, I'd like to thank the pe people in my group. You can see that all of us are wearing the same jersey, and I'm wearing it today proudly, and uh, from the Cancer Biology and Therapeutics Lab. And uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Liam. Um, so first up, we have a question from Walter Coach, um, but a reminder to everyone else that you can use the chat panel or the Q&A panel to uh, ask questions for any of the speakers. So Walter asks, can these three genes be linked to a molecular mechanism or a process? Uh, good question. I don't think they're intrinsically linked to each other. We know that FOXM1 and PTG1 may be linked biologically. So there may be, for example, PTG1 may be a downstream target of FOXM1. So it's a bit like PR being a downstream target of ER. So you could potentially infer, for example, if you don't have higher levels of FOXM1, maybe high levels of PTG1 infer that FOXM1 is active, similar to the way that it's done with ER. Uh, but the other uh, genes, ZNF 367, there's not much really known about it. So I don't, uh, I don't think they're all intrinsically linked to the same molecular mechanism. And again, if you look at something like FOXM1, it's been implicated across a whole variety of different biologies, I guess. So the only thing that we know is that two of those targets are linked biologically, at least in, in, in the context of transcriptional regulation. Okay. And we have another question from Anonymous. Yeah. And the question is, has the signature been tested for other cancers? Yeah, thanks very much, Anonymous. <laughs> uh, I like that one. Um, so, yeah, I, I, uh, we're very interested in looking at the whole idea is that we think because of the way we found the signature, that we think that these are uh, potentially utilizable across different cancer types. So we've currently, um, we're looking at the utility of it in prostate cancer. And it may not be the exact same signature. Certainly some of the genes from the, 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 the list we've looked at in silico, in silico data sets, for example, in, in the TCGA and showing some degree of prognostic utility. So the idea is we think that certainly some of those genes are implicated and for example, FOXM1 Fox has been implicated in the context of prostate cancer for a variety of different groups. But we just have to find what is the kind of optimal combination of these genes when put together. So we're right in the middle of that in prostate cancer. We're also interested in applying it in other cancer types, but also applying a similar approach in other cancer types, maybe doing a, a separate reverse engineering approach in other cancer types as well. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Liam. In the interest of time, I think uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Actually, we have the game first, I believe. We're not seeing a picture, so if you can hold the... Uh, Oh, okay. Okay. Narrowly correct. Well done, everybody. Okay, um, our next speaker is uh, Balin, who was hosting earlier, and she's from UCSF. All right. Um, can everyone see my screen? I think, yes, probably. I can see and hear you. Awesome, great. Okay, um, I'm excited to talk to you guys today about um, kind of bridging connections between bacterial infection and cancer. So something Nevin brought up earlier is this idea that a lot of the um, networks that we, that we identify as being important in disease really transcend a specific disease in general. And so this is a story um, where we've actually identified a mimic 
of a mammalian don't eat any signal in bacteria. So before we start, I just want to thank um, my two brave graduate students for joining a brand new lab in the midst of a global pandemic, um, as well as our collaborators at Stanford or Weissman's lab and Bill Robinson's lab um, and Jennifer Coburn's lab at Wisconsin School of Medicine who generally or generously provided us um, with some knockout uh, bacteria that we, that we use in these experiments. Uh, so when we think about the innate immune system, we often think about its role in clearing cells from our body. So these can be target cells that are exhausted red blood cells. These can be foreign cells um, and hopefully disease cells as well. Uh, one of the ways that phagocytosis is regulated is through these don't eat me ligand receptor interactions. So cells such as adult and healthy young red blood cells will express a don't eat me signal on the surface of their cell. And that will engage a don't eat me receptor on the surface of a macrophage. And this cytoskeletally blocks rearrangement and prevents these cells from being eaten by a macrophage. We know that cancer cells can upregulate these don't eat me signals in order to evade the innate immune system. And to date, four don't eat me signals um, have been discovered. The most uh, famous probably at this point is CD47, which is the don't eat me signal with a cognate SERP alpha receptor on macrophages. Uh, CD47 blockade has been shown clinically to be effective as a co-therapy uh, with rituximab in the context of DLBCL, shown here on the bottom of the slide, as well as in pre-malignancies in the blood and some solid tumors. Uh, a blocking antibody is the single drug in a company that recently was acquired for nearly $5 billion by Gilead. So this is a viable therapeutic strategy uh, for a lot of cancers. But what's recently been discovered is the fact that infected cells also overexpress CD47 on their surface. So shown here is a recent publication from the Weissman lab uh, that shows that uh, virally infected and bacterially infected cells um, are able to overexpress CD47. But this really begs the question to us of who plays a role in this overexpression? Is it the host or is it the pathogen? So pox viruses have been shown to express a CD47 mimic. Um, and this is actually thought to drive a lot of polymorphisms in the, the don't eat me receptor surf alpha. So depending on where your family's background is from, you may have a different type of SERP alpha. Um, and it's thought that this is largely driven by exposure to pox viruses. Um, this also then kind of suggested to us that potentially if viruses can do it, could bacteria as well? And if we wanted to look for them, how could we find them? So several years ago, a uh, CD47 affinity reagent called CV1G4 was developed. This is 50,000 fold more selective for CD47 compared to the receptor SERP alpha. And so we decided to start profiling different types of bacteria that were known to be extracellular pathogens that were able to evade the innate immune system. So we use CV1G4 as well as isotype controls and other blocking antibodies for CD47 to ask the question of, could we see binding of CV1G4 um, on the surface of different bacteria? And the bacteria we've focused on here is Borrelia burgdorferi. So this is a spirochete that's responsible for Lyme disease and the relapsing fever. And in fact, we see really nice um, binding of CV1G4 on the surface of Borrelia, um, much more so actually than these other known blocking antibodies against 47. And shown here is just uh, the fluorescence image of the spirochete. So it was exciting to see this by, fa by facts, but we also really wanted to understand how blockade of this molecule could potentially be affecting phagocytosis. So we generated um, macrophages from bl human blood and either challenged them with Borrelia that were pre-treated with our affinity reagent CG1G4 or isotype control. And we saw increased internalization of Borrelia that were pre-treated with our CD47 blocking antibody. In a mouse model of infection where we looked at IgM binding five weeks after a bolus of non-clearable infection, we were able to see a reduction in the amount of IgM binding. Um, and this was statistically significant beyond um, IgG4 and was not significant um, compared to clearable infection. 
However, when we began to do blast searches and sort of more sophisticated sequence homology searches um, across the Borrelia proteome with CD47, we really weren't able to see things. And this suggested to us that this was a mimic in structure rather than sequence. So we set out to perform a mass spectrometry experiment to identify what this CD47 mimic was. Uh, we were able to culture Borrelia in ways that allowed us to generate CD, uh, CV1G4 negative staining bacteria compared to CV1G4 positive staining bacteria. And we used this in combination with isotype controls as well as CV1G4 to be able to enrich for proteins that were selectively enriched in the CV1 positive Borrelia with CV1G4 exclusively. And using a series of filtrations, we actually were able to identify quite nicely, this never happens, um, a single surface protein, uh, P66. So P66 was really exciting to us because it's an integrin binding protein, um, much like CD47. Uh, we were able to recombinantly express P66 and ask the question of, could we enrich for a recombinant P66 with either CV1G4 or the native SERP alpha receptor on an FC? And so what you can see here is that while CV1G4 and SERP alpha bind to P66, we don't get appreciable enrichment with IgG4. We also were able to obtain these P66 knockout bacteria from Jennifer Coburn's lab and show that we lose binding with CV1G4 in our P66 knockout bacteria compared to wild type. And that P66 knockout bacteria are more readily uptaken by macrophages compared to their wild type partners. And so I mentioned before that there's highly, there's highly polymorphic surf alpha, depending on where you, you come from in the world. Um, but one thing that was consistent across all of our donors was the ratio and the ability of knockout P66 to be uptaken by these macrophages compared to wild type. So this was all extremely exciting to us, um, kind of as biologists finding these mimics, uh, but clinically, obviously, um, we were trying to, to find an understanding of if P66, which has been shown to be important for persistence and in infection, but isn't required for infection, the initial infection process, if there was any sort of clinical relevance we could learn. And Nitya Ramadas, who's a really talented postdoc in Bill Robinson's lab, was actually able to look at um, the B cell response from patients from two different cohorts of Lyme disease patients. These are either return to health patients or RTH, or these are patients who have um, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. So all of the patients in this cohort, I'm just showing six as an example here, um, were actually, they, I, they found a tick on them. They saw the arrhythmia of your grounds um, rash that you normally see. They then underwent 30 days of antibiotics. And we have three patients here who returned to health on the right and three patients who um, were actually unable to return to health afterwards. And so we can see on the top with uh, VIZE1, which is a known antigenic protein on Borrelia, is that all of the patients were able to form immune responses and develop antibodies against VIZE1. But all patients in return to health were able to develop antibodies against P66, while only a single patient um, was able to develop antibodies in response to P66. And so this suggests to us potentially that P66 um, is not only an antigenic protein, but is potentially a way that we can identify patients who are going to be less likely to respond to traditional antibiotic treatment. Uh, so in summary, I hope that I've convinced you that we perhaps have bacterial mimicry of these mammalian don't eat me signals. And so of course our next questions are, what domains of P66 are required for interaction with SERP alpha? Um, can we develop an affinity matured reagent specifically against P66 and not CD47 to really tease apart from an immunologic response perspective in an in vivo model whether or not we're looking at CD47 signaling or if we're looking at P66? And then finally, are there more of these mimics? You know, there's three other don't eat me signals. Or is, is it possible that other bacteria express um, P66 or similar as well? So these are all things that we're hoping to follow up on um, in the next few years. Uh, so with that, um, I can end my talk and I'm happy to take questions. Um, great, thank you. Uh, that was really cool. We have a first question from Charles Crick, which is, do any of the antibodies against P66 act as neutralizing antibodies 
versus just binding to it as an immunogenic response? So we know so far um, that there actually aren't, um, there's no really good blocking antibodies against P66 right now. So we're actually looking to go the opposite way and take our, the antibodies the, the antibodies that we've found in these patients and be able to try to make our own um, select P66 selective antibody that way. Okay, cool. Um, and Walter Colt wants to know, are the do not eat me signals also involved in acute infectivity or mainly determine whether infections persist? So it seems like P66 is not required for initial infection, but is required for persistence. We haven't looked at any of the others. And then a question from me. So you mentioned that there's no sequence homology um, and that, you, yeah, you had to do hard work to find this. So now, now that you have found this, do you think you could find others computationally? So we, we've been able to identify, um, P66 is pretty highly conserved in spirochetes. So okay. we have found um, some that way, but you know, getting approval to culture multiple types of spirochetes um, in a brand new lab in, in COVID times is, is a bit challenging. Um, okay. we're, we're also interested in extending this to kind of um, bacteria outside of spirochete world, but it does seem as if it's consistent um, within spirochete specifically so far. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, okay, I think we will move on to the next speaker. Um, uh, the next speaker is oh sorry we have our game first the the question has popped up without the uh, picture appearing on our screens still no picture okay you have five seconds to guess hopefully from now Okay, and the bulk of you got the correct answer, which is Ariana Watson. Okay, thank you, everybody. And our next speaker is Susan Quinn from UCD. Okay, so I'm just going to find my presentation here. So it does. Sorry, I just wanted to. I'm just having a bit of a trouble here. I, I could find it a minute ago and now it's not here for some reason. So one second. Sure. Sorry about this. Yeah, okay, so it should be there. Okay, I'll try one more time. I'll hopefully be there. Ah, yes, there it is. Okay, so sort I of walked away. Hopefully you can see it now. Yeah, we can see your slides. Okay, excellent. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Colm, and thank you to the organisers uh, for inviting me to, to contribute to this really exciting symposium. Um, so I'm a chemist, and so there's no patients involved in, in the study here, um, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that we've been uh, looking at in relation to uh, potential cancer therapeutics. And so in our group, in my, in my group, I'm, we're interested in molecules, photoactive molecules that can image and target DNA. And we're also interested in the photodynamics and the inherent photostability of DNA. So the very early stage processes that lead to uh, UV photo damage, which then can lead on um, to basically uh, skin cancer. So we, we look at it from a very fundamental approach. And then in addition to that, we're interested in utilizing nanoparticle based systems to also explore potential uh, cell damage. And, and in this instance today, this is what I'm going to focus on radio sensitization, as well as the potential for these nano carriers to be able to deliver photoactive molecules to a particular uh, site. And also then as well to facilitate in imaging and learning about the environment uh, within the cell. So I'm a highly, we're really interested, a lot of our work is collaborative, particularly when we uh, collaborate with cell biologists um, or colleagues in pharmacy with radio sensitization. So we primarily are materials and molecule based and then and collaborate uh, when, we, when we sort of have that interface with biology. 
So today I'm going to talk to you about one story, and that was our foray into the idea of radio-sensitized um, cancer cell death. And so what we were interested here is the phenomenon that if you have a high uh, atomic a number of elements such as gold, for instance, then when it's exposed to X-rays, it ejects electrons. They generate these secondary OJ electrons, generate reactive species, which accelerate or enhance uh, cell death. And that can also be by targeting uh, DNA within the cell. And to date, gold nanoparticles have been actively investigated uh, for this, um, for this um, reason. Uh, however, one challenge in doing this is to actually transport ideally large amounts of the gold nanoparticles and also to maybe have some control and to where the gold nanoparticles may go. And for this reason, what we would like, we posed this question was that could we develop materials, polymer supported nanoparticles? So we know that nanoparticles can enhance um, radiation therapy. Can we, by immobilizing them on polymer beads, can we then improve the efficiency at which they're taken up by cells and then enhance further the radio sensitization process? And in particular, we were interested in radio resistant cells, um, cancer cells, in particular breast cancer and prostate cancer cells. And this work was performed in collaboration with uh, Dr. John Tulkulter, who's in the School of Pharmacy at Queen's University in Belfast. So in order to do this, uh, the idea is that we, we generate the composites. We firstly, then after we've generated them and characterized them, we need to check, are they inherently toxic to cells or are, do cells tolerate them well? And then are they selectively toxic in the, in the presence of radiation? So the first thing that we need to do is prepare the composites. And so we, we take a, we, met, we prepare gold nanoparticles in the lab in a range of sizes. Uh, the smaller the better because we have greater surface area. So between here, I'm just show, showing a range between, we've prepared between four and 30 nanometers. And then we have different polymer particles as supports between 200 and two, and two microns. And so what we can do is that the, if we have amines at the surface of these beads, then there's a high affinity for the gold and so we can immobilize the gold nanoparticles at the surface. And then within the lab, we can perform lots of characterization methods to probe the size of the composite particles in solution, ensure that they remain dispersed using light scattering techniques. We can also probe this charge at the surface of these composites. We see that it flips when you cap these amine groups, which will be positively charged in aqueous environment. When you react with the gold particles, which are stabilized with negative charge, then you flip the charge in the species. And that's relevant as well on how particles interact with cells. And gold nanoparticles have this beautiful property of not being the gold that's in your ring, but being bright red, beautiful red solution, this ruby red color. So we can monitor them optically as well. So, so that's quite handy. And so you can see here a cuvette showing well dispersed particles in um, a vial that we can basically analyze. So using this method, we're able to generate a variety of supported nanoparticle sizes, and we can characterize then a range of numbers of particles at the surface, upwards to a thousand particles and more on an individual polymer particle. So in this way, we've achieved localization of the particles um, and a high concentration. The second question we need to ask is, are they biologically stable? And what we find is that they, we get significantly improved stability. Um, so ordinarily, these electrostatically stabilized GO particles will aggregate in high ionic strength environments, but the composite leads to additional stability and they're very well tolerated and they remain in dispersed uh, over, over a day when also they're in, for instance, cell culture media. So we have a very readily manipulatable and stable uh, dispersion of these polymer particles. And so once they're made and we characterize them, it's nice to be able to see them, seeing is believing, as they say, then we can start to see how do they interact with cells. So the first preliminary study we did was just to see, will cells tolerate them? And we see that actually uh, the percentage survival was very, uh, is, is high. So we, we don't see any adverse effects when cells are incubated uh, with these uh, polymer particles. And also this preliminary study indicated that they actually are internalized by the cells. So at this stage, we've made these particles, they're well tolerated by the cells and we can, and the cells, these uh, radiation resistant breast cancer cell line uh, internalize them very well. So the next question was, well, do they enhance 
uh, radio sensitization. And so to do that, actually, we, we did a related study and we looked at two sizes of the polymer. So we, we looked at these small nanoparticle, 4.5 nanometer uh, gold nanoparticles uh, supported on 100 nanometer polystyrene beads and 200 nanometer polystyrene beads. And so we, in particular, we were interested in these prostate cancer cell, this prostate cancer cell line, because it has a, it, it's radio resistant due to uh, DNA repair mechanisms and radical scavenger uh, mechanisms within, within these cells. And so this was quite a nice target to consider. And so we took the cells and treated them with 10 micrograms of the samples. We've got three samples, we've got free gold nanoparticles, uh, and then the two polymer supported nanoparticles. And just to bear in mind, it's 10 microgram per mil of sample. So when you introduce the polymer, you're redu reducing the effective amount of gold that you're exposing the cell to uh, in, in this process. So what did we observe? So firstly, we did some uh, clonogenic acid assay measurements. So we took the cells, incubated them for 24 hours. We found that they were very well tolerated again. And then we monitored the cells 12 days later. And, in and found again, the cells were very viable still. So again, no adverse effects over a long period of time, which is very important. Secondly, then we were able to use ICP, atomic absorption spectroscopy to actually quantify the amount of gold that was internalized in each cell. So we can see then that, what well, time is approaching, grand. Uh, we could see that we're actually, the polymers are bringing more gold across into the cells. But actually, when you take into account the amount of gold that was originally exposed to the cell, we actually find that the efficiency of the process is when you have particles on their own, it's only 4% efficient. When you immobilize them on the polymer, the 100 nanometer polymer, you enhance, bring that to 13% efficiency, and then you go up to 18% efficiency. So the polymers are far more efficient at bringing across the gold uh, into the cell. So that was one of the objectives. And then importantly, irradiating the cells with um, doses of radiation between zero and six gray, we saw that we got a 23% enhancement in cell death in the presence of these polymer particles. So that was a very positive result in the sense that it's showing that not only does it bring an enhanced the goal that's transported across, that's also reflected in then enhanced uh, cell death. So that's sort of captured here in that the polymer particles, yes, they are um, enhancing the cellular uptake and yes, then they are re re resulting in increased cell death. So just a couple of additional points is that when you have all these gold nanoparticles at a surface, you can get surface enhanced Raman and that means you can use it as a very sensitive way to report on molecules. And so this is potentially something that we can do as well as a sensitive reporter of the environment within cells. So this is just an example of showing how we can get femto detection of a model analyte at this surface. And then one final thing to note is that we don't really, we know about microplastics, we don't want to be really using plastics. So now we're actually looking at more biodegradable, biocompatible carbon uh, scaffolds such as biodegradable polymers and these lovely nanopore materials which is, are readily digested by enzymes and we've done a number of cell studies to show that they actually are transported very efficiently and we can also load these up with molecules as well that can lead to triggered cell death when we irradiate them. So this bodes to the potential going forward or the conclusions really, I sort of flew to that last part of the fact that you can use nanoparticle based systems for enhanced therapies. You can combine them with molecules as well for potentially delivery and a, a dual sort of uh, uh, effect. Um, and that these really are quite exciting and, and versatile uh, systems. So I'd just like to thank you for listening, thank the organisers for the invitation, and the students highlighted in red who did all the wonderful work, my collaborators, Jonathan Coulter and Jeremy Simpson, and all the funding agencies. Thank you very much. Thanks, Susan. Uh, that was great. Um, we have a first question from Walter, which is, can you target these nanoparticles to specific cell types or tissues? So, so that's a really good question. And that's why we, um, that's currently something that we're trying to do. The versatility of the platform means that we're trying to uh, link covalently attach 
uh, certain functional groups to the surface of the particles that will then direct where they go. So people have done this targeting folate receptors, for instance, um, and also different glyco uh, uh, recept base receptors at the surface. So there's definitely potential to do that. I think that's slightly beyond our remit. It's something that we'd be delighted to collaborate with somebody at, and we have the, the ability to immobilize those groups at the surface of the particles, but definitely that's something we'd love to do. Okay. And a question from Owen Smith. Um, do these polymers cross the blood brain barrier? Um, and could this be used, uh, could this be an approach for treating refractory leukemia, CNS refractory leukemia? So, so that's a very interesting question. Um, they, we, the size of them, uh, I suppose the, the, the key question is the blood brain barrier, it depends to be size related as far as I understand. It is possible that we could shrink the particles to a, a, the support particle and still concentrate a large number at the surface, but it's, it's, it's something I don't know actually at the moment, we haven't really tried that. Uh, these are relatively recent uh, results, but would be very interested to, to consider it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then just one from me, uh, kind of related to Walter's question, do they, I mean, is there, have you tested if they are in any way uniquely sensitizing cancer cells or do they have the same effect on healthy cells? So I, at the moment, because there's no, um, there's no targeted mechanism or uh, associated with it, I imagine at the minute they're not. We haven't tested it. We, we kind of focused on these first studies uh, to see would they enhance the process in, in radiation resistant cells. Um, I think the next, and that was the sort of, if that worked, then the second goalpost was, okay, we, we need to label these up to try and have a, a targeted uh, exposure as well. So yeah, it's a very good question and it's something we, we'd love to have a look at. Okay, great. Um, thank you. And I think we're going to move on to our game again. So fingers on the buzzers, folks. Okay, who's this handsome chap? <laughs> Yay, I think that's the highest score yet. <laughs> Question made slightly easier by the same background. Um, okay, uh, and the next speaker is uh, Trevor Bavona from UCSF. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully, okay. Are you able to see the slide? I can, yeah, and we can hear you. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to the organizers uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, uh, to present some work and, um, and learn from you all. Uh, so um, I'm a physician, lab-based physician scientist at UC Seth, um, and uh, today I'm going to present on uh, molecular networks underlying lung cancer evolution during, uh, during therapy, in particular molecular therapy. So just by way of brief background for level setting uh, for the uh, diverse group here, uh, we're very interested in understanding mechanisms of um, drug tolerance and of residual, so-called residual disease, which I'll highlight in a moment, uh, in particular in patients. Uh, on molecular therapies such as targeted kinase inhibitors and, and other molecular uh, treatments. And so this slide just represents sort of the paradigm of molecular medicine and oncology, where, where lung cancers and many other cancers are subtyped based on molecular uh, drivers of, of their disease, oncogenic alterations, for instance. Uh, and, those are, uh, and those are used then to match patients with specific uh, inhibitors uh, or modulators of those oncogenic driver proteins. Uh, one of the major challenges in, in the field is that although this is uh, greatly extended um, uh, uh, quality and quantity of life for patients, uh, there uh, by and large is inevitably um, uh, uh, the emergence of drug resistance, which uh, ends up uh, a lethal event in most patients, especially with advanced stage cancers. And so that's depicted on the bottom of the slide. I'm not sure if the um, pointer is showing, uh, but I've boxed in red um, uh, what one of the major uh, uh, unmet needs is in the field, and that's understanding not just um, uh, whether uh, tumors respond initially or eventually regrow later on, shown in orange, but this residual disease state or MRD, minimal residual disease state, uh, that characterizes most, um, uh, most patients who are treated with even our best molecular therapies uh, uh, in 2020. 
And so, uh, the data I'm going to present with you today, um, I'm going to highlight the clinical data set um, uh, that emerged by single cell RNA sequencing of, uh, of patient tumor biopsies on active therapy, uh, where we tried to unlock some of the biological mysteries that underlie uh, this residual disease state. This was enabled by a unique protocol that we established at UCSF, where we're able to uh, biopsy lung cancer patients, both prior to therapy, shown on the left of the slide, uh, and it, uh, shortly after they're matched to a molecular therapy, such as an EGFR inhibitor or a BRAF inhibitor or a RAS inhibitor these days. Um, and uh, uh, we were able to uh, access this partial response or, or minimal residual disease state in the middle of the slide, and then um, able to also assess the on-therapy disease progression uh, tumor that um, uh, emerged later. And this was a, uh, this is a, a, a fueled a number of um, uh, analyses and, uh, and models shown on the bottom of this slide. I'm going to focus on some of the single cell RNA sequencing data that emerged out of this um, in the last couple of years. So this was recently published, uh, and um, so I won't highlight every detail. This was published a few weeks ago, uh, but I want to highlight a few of the molecular networks that um, were a bit surprising to us um, and that we think were only uncovered because of the use of, um, uh, of an approach such as single cell sequencing that allowed us to unlock some of the um, uh, underlying heterogeneity. So this is the pipeline. Overall, we analyzed um, uh, 40, uh, uh, 49 uh, samples um, of uh, advanced stage lung cancer. These were subjected to a smart seq 2 protocol shown in the middle of the slide. Um, and so on the bottom of the slide on the left are the um, molecular drivers of lung cancer that were represented. And these are the standard clinical ones, EGFR mutations, BRAF mutations, ALK translocations, um, and, and a couple of other ones that are clinically relevant. And all of these patients were, again, were on molecular therapy matched to those oncogenic alterations. We're able to, sh in the middle of the circle plot there, um, you see the representation across the different disease states. So TN, treatment naive, 15 samples, residual disease, 14 samples, and progressive disease, uh, 20 samples. And again, all of these are on therapy, apart from the treatment naive, which is just prior to initiation of therapy. So overall, we sequenced almost uh, 20, uh, just over 23,000 cells. These included epithelial, immune, and stromal cells, shown on the right. And uh, we were able to first uh, analyze um, the genetic landscape uh, of, of these because of the smart seq 2 um, uh, uh, protocol and the depth it provides. And so we actually examined each sample for the oncogenic alterations that were clinically uh, called by a clinical test, uh, whether it's an ALK translocation or a KRAS mutation or an EGFR mutation. And I'm highlighting one particular case here, and there are many more cases in the, in the manuscript itself, uh, where the single cell RNA sequencing actually uncovered uh, genetic heterogeneity at the RNA level by colonization uh, at the RNA level here that was not detected by the clinical bulk sequencing assay that was used to diagnose the patient and therefore meant to treat the patient. And so here was a case of eml 4 alk lung cancer that a patient was treated with an ALK inhibitor uh, and actually did not um, experience a, a, a very uh, robust response. Um, and when we sequenced uh, the, the tumor, we found that not only did it have the ALK translocation, but by, RNA se by single cell sequencing, we also found evidence of multiple KRAS mutations. And these are bona fide oncogenic KRAS mutations like G12C, G13D, you can see. So uh, the single cell RNA sequencing was able to uncover uh, occult genetic heterogeneity uh, at the RNA level. Switching gears um, to uh, examine the transcriptomes that, that were uh, exposed uh, by the RNA-seq, uh, one of the striking signatures, again, that we were not expecting, uh, and, uh, that emerged uh, by comparing the residual disease cancer cells to the other states, the treatment naive and residual disease, was a unique alveolar type 1 and type 2 signature. And that's shown here on the left. So the norm, a normal AT uh, alveolar type 2 signature, and, and, and these are cells that are present in normal healthy lungs, of course, uh, is shown in, in purple. Uh, and you can see an enrichment uh, towards uh, this, this type of gene signature shown in green in RD in the residual disease cancer cells that was state specific, not present at the treatment naive or progressive disease state. We were able to, to also um, uh, develop models of, of residual disease using patient-derived um, organoids and cell line models, and so shown in the panel B there, is that we can indeed detect markers of that residual disease state that were uncovered clinically also in the cell line models in a controlled system uh, at what would be the sort of persister or residual disease time point. And then we were able to validate um, that at the protein level, several markers were upregulated, um, uh, such as aquaporin 4, specifically at the residual disease state shown towards the right in panel C. Interestingly, when we project the signature onto the, uh, uh, the TCGA lung cancer data set, we find that actually patients uh, in that data set who have evidence of this uh, alveolar type 1, type 2 signature uh, actually show uh, improved outcome. Um, and we think this might represent sort of a, a, um, a disease persistence um, state uh, that is um, uh, that the cancer cells maintain, but, but perhaps in a less aggressive state at the residual disease uh, time point there, um, it's sort of a, a drug-tolerant persister-like hibernation state, um, and that may reflect why uh, patients in the TCGA data set uh, who harbor the signature might have more indolent cancers, relatively speaking, although we're exploring that mechanistically uh, further. Uh, 
Um, one of the other signatures that arose um, and that was connected to the alveolar signature at, RD, at this residual disease state was the beta nicotinin pathway. And so there's uh, summarizing a lot of data here in this slide, but the take home message is that we observed not only the enrichment of nuclear beta catenin, um, uh, but, but also uh, markers of that uh, residual, uh, the alveolar type one and type two like state in the cancer cells in, in multiple, uh, across the, the broader cohort and in multiple individual uh, uh, patient match samples also. Um, we were able to go back to our cell line models, and this was in collaboration with Sarai Bhaniapati, who many of you know in this, is in this meeting, uh, developing, again, models of this residual disease state in vitro using patient-derived EGFR mutant or, or ALK variant-driven uh, uh, cell lines, uh, and that the, the models are just shown here. Um, they're refractory to apoptosis when they become drug tolerant. Um, and then we tested whether um, the hypothesis arising out of the clinical data said whether, in fact, beta catenin signaling as part of this alveolar type 1, type 2 signature might actually be mediating uh, drug tolerance. And so uh, we um, actually treated these patient derived cells with multiple went beta catenin inhibitors, some of which are in clinical trials, uh, and found, in fact, that co-treatment with um, an EGFR inhibitor or an ALK inhibitor along with the beta catenin inhibitors actually suppressed uh, the, the in vitro development of, uh, of residual disease. So we're continuing to explore this uh, further mechanistically. Um, and I'm uh, only uh, one, uh, almost out of time here, so one or two more minutes uh, just to close out. Uh, one, a few of the other signatures uh, that, we, um, that we uncovered uh, using both the clinical data sets and again, RNA-seq profiling um, as shown here in this heat map of uh, the uh, in vitro models was again, state-specific expression uh, of certain gene sets in the um, for sister or residual disease uh, states there. Um, one of which, um, which uh, potentially is connected to the alveolar signature and beta catenin signaling is activation of the, of the um, hippo effector YAP. Uh, and uh, in fact, going back to the clinical specimens, we similarly found that um, uh, evidence of activation of YAP here by nuclear staining for nuclear YAP, uh, by, by IHC staining for nuclear YAP, uh, specifically at the residual disease stage as shown here on the left quantified in the cohort and on the right an individual case example. Um, and, and suppressing YAP uh, by, by genetic means uh, actually also suppressed uh, the development of the persister residual disease cells uh, in vitro. So overall, and again, I don't have time to go through all the details, uh, we were able to uncover using this uh, clinical data set of, our, of single cell RNA-seq state-specific uh, molecular networks both in the cancer cells at residual disease, and I don't have time to discuss today, but also at the progressive disease state, um, including, interestingly, cell-cell communication such as gap junk protein, uh, which we're exploring mechanistically. Um, and finally, to close out, I don't have time to go into this at all, uh, but there were interesting molecular networks and evidence of cell-cell uh, crosstalk also in the microenvironment, which was um, a profile as well in this study. Uh, and so we found uh, briefly that, in fact, these tumors prior to therapy had a relatively cold microenvironment, and this actually, quite interestingly, um, uh, flipped to a, a, more, a more inflamed or hot microenvironment at the residual disease state. And, uh, and switched back to a cold microenvironment uh, uh, at the progressive disease state. And so this suggests that there may be, again, window of opportunity, uh, molecular networks and, and, and targets uh, in this landscape of, of lung cancers to reposition therapies uh, in a state-specific, clinical state-specific fashion. So with that, I'll just acknowledge um, uh, both uh, many of the members of my lab who were involved in this work. Uh, UCSF, also a large collaborative effort, Colin Blakely and Colonel McCoach in our lung cancer uh, group, Sarad Bamiapati, and uh, Heidi Shah, postdoc in, in his lab, as well as Jonathan Weissman. Uh, and this was a close collaboration with the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, and the efforts there were led by Spiros uh, Darmanis. Um, and I want to also acknowledge the Cancer Moonshot for, for helping to fund this work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, that was great. Um, and we have a first question from Alexi, who's actually going to be the next speaker as well. And um, Alexi asks, did you observe reactivation of EGFR-related signaling in EGFR-resistant or residual disease states? Yeah, excellent question. Um, we did, and that, that was expected. Um, you know, EGFR signaling um, uh, is often reactivated either directly by on-target mutations. In this data set, there were not very many on-target mutations, second-site drug-resistant mutations, uh, but there was evidence of um, a parallel pathway signaling um, through other uh, RTKs or, or downstream events. Um, and so we did see evidence of that, um, uh, and that was almost a positive control. We were sort of expecting that, so we didn't dwell on it too much in, 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 this, in this particular study. Okay. Uh, another question from uh, Walter. Any speculations on the source of the heterogeneity? 
That's a great question. Uh, I, I would say that, um, you know, what we're, I, I would say as a field in lung cancer and others as well, the more profiling we're doing of advanced cancers, we're finding more and more genetic heterogeneity. So multiple oncogenic mutations, and, and this has been published by multiple groups. You know, the paradigm that, that, that advanced cancers, um, you know, have one oncogenic driver and, and therefore you should treat the patient, um, you know, with a drug, a single drug against that oncogenic driver, you know, is, um, is I think starting to, to, uh, to shift a bit um, because again, like we found, um, even by, by other sequencing assays, we're finding multiple evidence of multiple oncogenic alterations in many of these cancers. Um, and that out case that I shared with you highlights that. Um, what's the source? Uh, you know, the, um, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, obviously there are influences that we don't understand that, that generate any of these oncogenic alterations. And so whether it's breakdown in DNA repair, uh, whether it's germline differences in, in uh, you know, susceptibility or DNA repair, exp uh, gene expression or function, uh, you know, I think those are open questions in the field. Okay, um, and then one further question from me. So you had two different KRAS mutations in the same patient. Yep. Um, is that common? I mean, do you see that across lots of examples? We saw that in a few examples, and again, we've seen that in in other examples in lung cancer, and others have reported this in other cancers as well. But you know, this the general concept. Um, you know, I think that was a bit surprising. So you know, one of the one of the challenges of single cell RNA sequencing, and of course, you can't get at this at all by bulk, is that it's very difficult to know whether the uh, mutations are in the same cell or different cells. Um, so if you've noticed on this slide that on the schematic, our model is that we we could not prove that they were in the same cell in most of these cases. So uh, you know, we. Uh, we put forth a cautious model where, where you know, the, uh, they may reside in different cells. And so that may mean that, the, that these, some of these patients have multiple cancers, essentially, because, uh, you know, k rice mutant cancer is different from an EGFR mutant cancer or an ALK mutant cancer or an ALK driven cancer. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I think the, the one exception um, is that um, in the drug resistance samples, you know, we often see that in the same, you know, where we can prove it on um, select cases, that there are KRAS mutations, for example, present within an EGFR mutant cancer cell, but that's likely because the um, you know, EGFR activity is, uh, is suppressed um, continuously by the EGFR inhibitor in those examples, and the KRAS mutation is selected for or emerges uh, and is able to, to, to drive uh, cancer cell growth. And uh, you know, the, um, you know, otherwise, you know, oncogenic EGFR and oncogenic KRAS in the same cell would probably drive cells, uh, you know, and there's some data to suggest this drive cells into senescence or growth rest because of oncogenic uh, the oncogene induced stress. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker, who's Alexi uh, Rutlenko from. Um, oh, sorry, before Alexi, we have our challenge again. Um, so, five seconds. Okay, correct again. Well done, everybody. Um, Trevor, there's a question for you in the Q&A that we didn't have time to get to. So if you have time to answer that by text, please do so. Um, and we'll move on to Alexi from SBI now. So can, you can see here, yes? I can see your slides and I can hear you. Okay, thank you. So um, hello, uh, my name is Alexi Ruklenko and today I will uh, tell you the story how we combined the mathematical modeling and wet lab experiments to find new ways to target oncogenic RAS. So everyone knows about MAPK pathway. This pathway is one of the main drivers of cell proliferation. Activating mutations in this pathway account for more than 30% of all cancers. And this pathway is extremely hard to inhibit. For example, if there are activating mutations in BRAF, uh, there are nice uh, specific inhibitors, for example, Vimorafinib or Dabrafinib, uh, which inhibit this pathway, and this results in a very good uh, clinical response. But six to eight months later, uh, very often, in more than 80% of cases, uh, the resistance develops, pathway reactivates, and cancer progresses once again. In case of RAS mutations, until recently there were no target therapy available, now it's uh, GTOFC, but there are lots of the rest of um, RAS mutations. And in this case, RAF inhibitors activate the pathway instead of inhibiting it. Um, which is called paradoxical activation. MAC inhibitors do not really sufficiently inhibit the pathway. So this is reactivation of this pathway or insufficient inhibition with the, of this pathway which results in resistance. And efficient inhibiting of this pathway would be uh, really very beneficial. 
to understand how this resistance can happen and how reactivation phenomena can happen, we applied uh, the theory developed by Professor Boris Holodenko. It's called modular response analysis. And one of the main equations of the theory you can see here on the top. This equation connects the system level responses to drugs with the drug responses of their primary targets through the quantified network topology, which node activates which and inhibits which. So if we see that uh, there is some increase in uh, signaling in response to drugs, this is either something wrong with topology or with drug response to the primary target. Uh, while we apply this theory, we found out that if we have linear pathway with arbitrary number of feedback connections, either positive or negative, complete reactivation cannot happen. Feedback can give partial reactivation and partial resistance, but never complete. However, complete reactivation is observed both in resistant cell lines and clinically. So in this case, if something is wrong, we should go for uh, drug responses of primary targets. And we analyzed uh, these uh, responses in primary targets starting from rough kinesis. So when rough kinesis are wild type and RAS is oncogenic mutant, rough signals as a dimer, uh, which is bound to oncogenic RAS and phosphorylates MEC, propagating the oncogenic signal. We analyzed all crystal structures uh, publicly available in PDB of rough kinase domains and found that they mainly differ by position of two intermolecular motifs, which is alpha C helix and DFG motif. And roughly speaking, they can be uh, found in uh, two different positions, which we call in and out. So all the structures fall into three categories because there is no out-out conformations. Importantly, we also found that in the dimer, uh, two molecules cannot simultaneously occupy alpha C out position because of sterical limitations. And this is not only classification of rough kinase domains, but also classification of inhibitors, depending on which conformation for them is preferred. So we performed the docking simulations, uh, which showed us that isoform specificity can account three to five fold difference in uh, affinity. But conformation specificity accounts for more than 100 fold difference in uh, affinity. So what is really important is what conformation is preferred to rough inhibitor and not which isoform is preferred. We took this now, uh, and these uh, differences are not only artifacts of crystallization. Molecular dynamic simulations of BRF kinase domains show that in absence of inhibitor, DFG and alpha C constantly flip flop between in and out positions just to thermal motion spontaneously. So we took this knowledge and we also took the knowledge about all important phosphocytes in MAPK pathway and put it together into mathematical model, uh, which is supposed to predict pathway responses depending on inhibitors and their structural properties. We ran the simulations and after that tried to validate them experimentally. So uh, in brief, uh, the model uh, considers every molecule as uh, structured objects, which consists of domains and phosphocytes. Domain can bind to other domains. Phosphocytes can be phosphorylated or dephosphorylated. When we consider dimers, we consider all possible combinatorial combinations of BRF monomers and dimers, CRF monomers and dimers, and BC heterodimers or homodimers with one or two molecules of inhibitors. And considering each complex, we also take into account transitions between DFG and alpha C in and out uh, when inhibitor is bound or not bound. So this is kind of multi-scale model going from whole pathway up to details of intermolecular interactions. And uh, we run the simulations. First, what we found is that all rough inhibitors induce paradoxical activation, except of paradox breakers. However, paradox breakers do not inhibit dimers. So if we take something that inhibits dimers, it always will induce paradoxical activation in some region, which is normalized on KD, should be more or less the same. Also, uh, we found that uh, surprisingly, combining two rough inhibitors targeting the same pocket in the same kinase, but in different conformations, will be synergistic. So how it happens? We have the rough dimer. Here you can see it on the left, uh, where we see these flip-flop motions. When we take one inhibitor, and it binds to one of the molecules in a dimer, the opposite molecule in the same dimer tries to occupy the opposite position. For example, if it's alpha C out inhibitor, the dimer, the second molecule occupies alpha C in position. If it's type two inhibitor, it binds to alpha C in, the second equilibrium shifts to alpha C out. 
and the second molecule of the same inhibitor doesn't bind that well. It binds with decreased affinity. This is why paradoxical activation happens. However, if we take the other molecule which binds to opposite conformation, for example, alpha south for alpha seen and vice versa, the, for this molecule, the affinity is increased. And this is how uh, two inhibitors targeting different conformations of alpha C bind synergistically and inhibit the dimer. On the right, you can see the uh, calculations of the model, which shows the synergy for combination. And on the bottom, you see the experimental validation of it, where we took different drug inhibitors from the same structural classes and different cell lines, uh, NRAS mutant and KRAS mutant, and we saw the synergy in binding and inhibiting. And this is not only inhibiting the pathway, but also killing cells. We did MTS assay and clonogenic assay uh, for different rough inhibitors and for uh, NRAS mutant melanoma, KRAS mutant pancreatic cancer, KRAS mutant uh, colorectal cancer, NRAS mutant acute myeloid leukemia. And in all of these cases, we saw synergy in uh, suppressing cells by the combinations of rough inhibitors. Uh, so our model can uh, predict actually responses not only to RAF inhibitors, but to any inhibitors in this pathway. And we analyzed it beyond the RAFs. And what we have seen is that we, if we combine RAF inhibitor with uh, some other inhibitor, for example, MAC inhibitor, given high dose of RAF inhibitor, we see synergy. But if the dose of RAF inhibitor is low, RAF inhibitor activates the pathway and MAC inhibitor inhibits the pathway. So they work in antagonistic directions and we observe antagonism. The unique feature of combination of RAF inhibitors that this combination decreases the range of paradoxical activation. This is something that no other uh, combinations with RAFs can do. So um, we have uh, shown surprising effect that uh, two small molecules targeting the same uh, Pocket can be synergistic, and we try to uh, analyze can we go beyond RAFs. And using the same approach of computational modeling and experiments, we have shown that at least for JAK kinases and RBB receptor tyrosine kinases, we see similar effects. Dimerization induces resistance, and the way to overcome it is to combine uh, conformation specific inhibitors. And we found a patent application to protect the whole idea of using two small molecule inhibitors targeting different conformations uh, to overcome dimerization induced resistance. Uh, so, in summary, we have developed a new way of modeling pathways, which takes into account protein structure. This way showed us a new way to target oncogenic RAS. And uh, we started uh, collaboration with Dr. Daniel Van Hoff from uh, uh, TGN Institute in Arizona. And there is um, a clinical trial plans on a combination of RAF inhibitors in uh, keras mutant pancreatic cancer. So on this, I would like to thank uh, our collaborators and uh, thank you for your attention. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Alexi. Um, that was uh, great again, and we have re some questions already. Um, first of them is from uh, Kayvon Showcat, and who says it was a beautiful talk. Um, and he says, I really like your two RAF inhibitor combinations to bind the different monomers in the dimer. Do you think it would be possible to make a linked molecule of two different RAF inhibitors to span the two RAF binding sites? Or did they face different directions? Well, actually, here I said that we're looking for collaborators to synthesize better kinase inhibitors. And actually, this is exactly the idea uh, which, we, which we are looking chemists to do this. So, Yes, we do believe that such linked molecules would be really beneficial. Uh, we filed the second patent application to protect it as idea, but we need some chemists who can make such drugs. Our calculations show that they should work really efficiently. Okay, uh, Kevin replies, okay, let's do it. So I suggest you follow up online. And Nevin has chimed in to say fantastic. Um, Thank you. So do we have any further questions from the panel? or from the general audience. Mm. Okay, we've no further questions, um, unless Walter is trying out. Oh, Walter is our next speaker here. Uh, but before Walter speaks, we're gonna have our poll again. So you have to guess who this is within five seconds.
So it's Jonathan Bond, and most of you got that correct. So well done. Okay, and then we have our final speaker of the session, uh, as Walter Coach from UCD and SBI. Uh, I can see your slides, Walter, but I think you're still on mute. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, great. Thanks everybody for hanging around for the last talk. Uh, this is about, again, drugs and therapies and diagnostics. Uh, <clears throat> So cancer rates are actually soaring. So cancer now has overtaken heart disease as the most common cause of death in Ireland. Currently, one in two people in Ireland will develop cancer during their lifetime, and that rate is actually going up. So we do have a problem. Uh, it seems like we are walking through these gates of health, which I showed you in the beginning, under the cave of the cats. But let's try how we can skin the cat. So engineers actually have done something a long, for a long time, uh, which we in biology haven't done. And what they do is before they actually construct something, a car or an aircraft engine, what they do is they construct it on the computer. They build a digital twin. And this is what we want to adopt to try to tackle cancer. So when we again take some uh, <coughs> artistic license from engineering, uh, as far as I'm aware, the most complex piece of engineering humans have built is the space shuttle. It is about, um, I think, a million, uh, or million part, 10 million parts. Uh, but the human body has about 10,000 times more parts than the space shuttle. So this just gives you an um, idea of the scale of the problem which we are facing. Because what we want to do is basically develop a blueprint which allows us to understand but also then to action upon what we understand and fix things which are broken. But we are dealing <clears throat> with this huge complexity of the human body. Uh, and can we actually make these maps? So that's the idea. And I show you one example that if we are at the verge of um, <clears throat> that I think we can make this work. And this is neuroplastoma, which is a childhood tumor. It, the name is a little bit misleading. It actually is a disease of, of the peripheral nervous system and typically um, arises in the adrenal gland, but it can grow really, really big. It uh, typically affects small babies and it's the most heterogeneous disease in prognosis of all cancers. There is uh, variants of the disease which can kill the, the child in a few months, but there's also metastatic variants which spontaneously without any treatment go away. <clears throat> So it's really important to choose the severity of the treatment because the treatment is genotoxic chemotherapy and you don't want to give too much of this or much more than you need to a small baby. The only known marker which we have uh, is MIGN gene amplification. So that is always associated with poor prognosis. But there's also other high-risk neuroblastomas uh, which have no known marker and about half of them we actually can't identify. So can we find the biomarker? And we try to use this uh, digital twin approach. We integrated a number of <clears throat> multi-omics data, which we generated on cell lines. So we had protein interaction data, we had uh, chip sequencing data, we had messenger RNA expression, micro RNA expression, phosphoproteomics, and the knockdown screen against the drug genome. And we integrated all these data and arrived at this network. And you can see this network is fairly complicated, but it's still fairly small. So the data integration itself already reduces a lot of complexity. And we can reduce this further now because this is a statistical type, machine learning type of model, but uh, it is sufficient that we can analyze this and actually identify the components which really determine the behavior of this model and then cast these components into an ODE model where we really can do dynamic simulations. And that model analysis, analysis then shows that it's really only three components which matter. Only three components which basically determine what this network does and how it behaves. And now it's actually fairly easy to jump straight into patient data because we only need to measure three things in patients. We don't need to measure uh, all these <clears throat> multitude of 
parameters again. And if we do this, we actually can now parameterize the generic model with patient data and derive patient-specific models. So each patient has its own, his or her own model. And the, this is the response curve, which is a hill coefficient, and the steeper it is, the better is the prognosis. And you can see this how it plays out in the Kaplan-Meier curve. Uh, patients who have this very steep response do well, and patients who have this poor response, this flat response, do poorly. So can we actually identify the high-risk patients? Yes, we can. So this is a, a cohort which is non-amplified. So we have eliminated all the known biomarker patients and we can uh, very well identify the <clears throat> patients who have good survival versus those who have poor survival. And even in the MIG and amplified cohort, the cohort where we know which is bad prognosis, we still can stratify the patients further with that model. So that means the mathematical model is a really good biomarker. And if you think about it, it's not too surprising because even though we end up with one number, that number contains a whole lot of information. Um, we also asked the question now, can we actually look at relapse? And we only have seven patients, but uh, these are the data. In the primary tumor, that's the broken blue lines. These were all patients who initially responded except that one. But when they relapse, the curve flattens. So that would suggest it's actually the same mechanism responsible for relapse, which is responsible for a good or a bad response, uh, prognostic um, response in the first place. And that's also an important piece of information because that actually can, is something what we can link back to the pathogenetic mechanisms. So this was about diagnostics, but the beauty is if using computational models, uh, they help us to diagnose patients because we identify key control elements. But that's actually only the flip side of the coin because these are also good molecules to target for therapy. And this is what we tried. So the most common therapy in neuroblastoma is genotoxic chemotherapy, which causes DNA damage. And that basically <clears throat> prompts the cell to assess, can I repair the damage or or not. And the key decision maker is the P53 network. If P53 is phosphorylated in serine 15, the cell can repair it and survive the damage. If the damage is too big, um, P53 becomes phosphorylated in serine 46 and the cell dies. So we have here a phosphorylation switch, uh, which we model again with an ordinary differentiation, ordinary differential equation model. And what this model does is basically looking at the switch between the phosphorylation and as we increase DNA damage, we see that serine 15 phosphorylation goes up. If the damage becomes too big, the cell switches over to serine 46 phosphorylation and that actually coincides with the switch between DNA repair and the cell dying. So if we apply this to patients, you see here a patient who switches well. So serine 15 phosphorylation goes up and drops and 46 phosphorylation comes up. And that patient responds well. Uh, patients who have this straight line, they basically don't respond well. And if we do this for a bigger cohort, <clears throat> each line is a patient. You can see that the patients who switch respond well, the patients who don't switch don't. And in the high risk um, population, which is the again amplified one, we have almost uh, exclusively straight lines. And these are just the Kaplan-Meier plots. Patients who switch respond well, patients who can't uh, switch respond poorly. And even in the high risk population, we get this uh, differential in response. Can we use this to design personalized therapies or find personalized targets? Yes, we can. So this is each column here is a patient. And this is actually a heat map which sort of predicts which target we should hit in each patient. And you see with at one glimpse, they're different. So in most patients would benefit from CHECK2 inhibition, but you see it can be very, fairly individuals. But that's a good start that we can actually identify those targets. So this brings me to the end. The <clears throat> work has involved many people, but the main people who have done this work was Melinda Hallas and Dave Groucher, and also big thanks to the Convict Core Technologies. And the computation was done mainly by Dirk Fay and Axel Kuhn uh, with help by Boris Kolodenko. 
And just a few words, we want to expand this further by system, more systematically integrating multionic state and constructing these digital twins to derive better therapies and more precise diagnostics. And this is the main topic of this Position Oncology Island project, which was mentioned at the beginning. And uh, I'm coordinating this. Liam Gallagher is the co-coordinator. And this is a consortium consisting of uh, academia, charities, and industry. And if you're interested to learn more about it, here's the website. Thank you. Thanks, Walter. Um, that was a really nice presentation to end on, and we have some questions already. Um, so, can your model predict which genes, uh, when co-mutated with p53, would push cells towards apoptosis if p53 could be reactivated? And that's from Kayvon Shokat. Uh, that's a, a very, very good suggestion. It, currently, we can't, but in principle, it's possible. We would need to make the model bigger at the moment. We took a very reductionist approach because we tried to get from these very big models, which we get from omics data through the data integration to smaller models, but then the fairly small models where we can do these dynamic simulations, which also have a time component, and where we really can see the dynamic response. And these models tend to be fairly small but we can go back the other way and then include uh, other components. For instance, we already had included initially a knockout screen, so we could, for instance, include synthetic lethal genes um, to answer that question. Okay. Um, and then a question from me. So how much, of, how much of this is made much harder because for patients, you mostly have transcriptomics? rather than proteomics or phosphoproteomics? Yeah, the, the transcriptomics is a, um, simply because this is what is easier to produce than the proteomics at the moment, especially with samples where the amount of tissue is very, very limited. Uh, but uh, I think Callum has shown data recently that actually there can be a very good correlation between proteomics and transcriptomics data. It's mainly a question of the data quality uh, we are actually as a project in this uh, precision oncology consortium with the Children's Hospital where we longitudinally monitor 10 patients from diagnosis through therapy, through re relapse, and from bone marrow biopsies. And we do this by combining transcriptomics, proteomics, and possible also metabolomics. So okay. we're trying to get there. Cool. Okay, thanks everybody. That's all of the talks for today. I don't know if uh, Walter or Nevin needs to chime in at this point. We're going to be back at the same time tomorrow for more talks. I would just say yeah, I would just like. Oh, go ahead, Walter. I just would like to thank all the speakers. I think it was a fantastic afternoon or morning. Lots of interesting things. I learned a lot, and it's really exciting to have this symposium, even though it's only virtual rather than in person. Yeah, I'll just add to that, I thought it was a great um, morning slash afternoon of talks. I'd like to thank all the speakers. You could already see some great synergy happening, which is really exciting. Um, and uh, if you hadn't had your Guinness, now's the time you can, um, you can enjoy it. If you've had it, then you should maybe get some more. But uh, So we'll, we'll see you guys back here tomorrow at the, the same time, same place. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.